Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Fistful of Dice. My name is Matt. It's Provoker time, baby. We're back. Yeah. All right. Round of applause for us, I guess. Uh, thank you for joining us for this session of the Provoker's Bleak Wrath. This is the 13th session, and it's also <laughs> our first session in, I think, over a year at this point, which is uh, just crazy, but it feels so good to be back. Uh, and I'm excited to have all of you in the chat joining us. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you so much. Uh, so tonight we are going to uh, we're going to do a recap of what's been going on, uh, but we're also going to check in with all of these lovely people down below me here. Normally, when we start a game of the Provokers, we start by having everyone tell us their character and and their name and everything. But today. I'm going to ask these guys, hey, what have you been doing over the last year? What sorts of things have you been up to? What achievements have you had? What books have you uh, laid out for uh, uh, every night of your life? That sort of thing. So we're going to check in with these guys, and they can also refresh us on who they are playing uh, in this wonderful campaign of ours. So... Go ahead and start from my left to right with Barker. Barker, how's it going, man? What have you been up to for the last year? Uh, it's tell us really about good. what's what's going on. I'm actually going to post this picture on my Patreon right now. That's what I've been up to this past year. I started a Patreon at patreon.com slash inspire the story filled with guided creativities, uh, kind of meditative podcasts, and we're going to do some streams and it all starts next month. Uh, other than that, a dead man's guide to dragon grin is the book that I'm going to save for Tim to talk about. And when, when, with what he's been doing for the last year. Uh, but I can't wait to hear him talk about that. Uh, we're working on uh, the battle for Arctur's vault, which is absolute tabletops next adventure kit set in the world of Enkea, one of Arbitron's worlds. And I'm really stoked to, uh, put that out there. And just after in, in the wake of this, the awesomeness that was a dead man's guide, everything is coming back all at once. And I love that that includes the provokers. We're doing so many things now. And then now we get to provoke on September 16th, 2020, and it's making the year a lot better. Absolutely. It is. Oh, and who are you playing Barker? What's your character's name? What's your deal? I got too caught up in the showy of the phone and the freaking Patreon post. But uh, <laughs> I am playing Holly Rast, who is uh, part of the Blood Guard of Falhast. No longer. She has been on the road with these provokers for a long time now. And her loyalties now lie elsewhere as she learns more and more about this world and more and more about herself. Dope, man. All right, Mike, I know before we went live, you were telling us all the horror story about your uh, floor, um, but what else has been going on other than uh, leaking air conditioners uh, over the past year? I'm, I'm supposed to follow Barker. <laughs> that's, that's like, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's, let's, let's let, the, let's let the, the, the cover band just, just, just be the main event, and we'll just put ACDC on first. Like, it's like, everyone oh, in man. the chat, everyone in the chat say in all caps, disagree. <laughs> because Edric is the one and one true provoker. Uh, I don't even know who that is. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I, I am playing Edric Meadows, uh, a, a young, um, a young man who is kind of caught up in the romanticism of the provokers and what they stood for, and wanted to kind of rekindle it, uh, uh, and wanted to kind of be a shining example, and of course meeting. Uh, his heroes and of course uh, funny thing when you meet your heroes that doesn't always go according to plan and I think he's changed a lot uh, since that that first time in uh, in Falhast so uh, and uh, of course he goes by like 10 million names which I'm sure Chad is like running through like every single one yeah they uh, literally just they did are. Matthew McCarron <laughs> did and also everyone is Champion. saying disagree in all caps so yeah <laughs> there you go absolute champions um so uh, but as far as uh what have i been doing for a year uh, i mean i have run uh 
been running uh, a couple of games on uh, on Jake Jake's channel, uh, MTD and D, uh, or uh, MTD on on Twitch. Um, Jake is amazing. I really suggest if you are not subscribed to Jake's Twitch channel, is go not right now. You know, maybe stay or or open another tab. I've heard that you can do that. <laughs> That's now, a thing that's, now, Mike. You that's, can do that on a computer. I've, yeah. I've heard this. I've heard this. Uh, the so, legends speak of it. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I'm, mode. I'm just I'm used to like my Pentium three. Yeah. Um, you know, with the with the 16 megabytes of RAM and stuff. Wow. I mean, Ooh, that's a lot wow. of dedicated RAM, my boy. Oh yeah, the the Edo stuff, the good stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, other than that, uh, work and home and yeah, leaky air conditioners and other things like that. Um, but I am so looking forward to tonight. It it's like coming home and putting on putting on your favorite pajama pants. This for me, it's like game. getting home and taking my pants off. I'm just like just Legit. dropping them. Yeah, that that's fair. I I I can't quite do that. Well, yeah, I guess, I guess I can. You can do whatever you want, Mike. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you know. <laughs> awesome. Uh, awesome, Mike. Well, it's great to have you back with us, dude. All right. Uh, Nate, I think, did you hit 100,000 between the last session and now at the 100,000 subs on YouTube? I don't, I think it was last summer. I think it was like, okay. Yeah. Over a year ago. Okay. Well, when was, it was our last session? I like, it's been 48 years. I don't know. It's been a long Since time. 1972. <laughs> year I of our Lord. Not three. At this point, we're contracting with Nate's agent to get him a couple of hours of spare time to come yes. play Provoker's game. Yes. Uh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> if only. Um, okay. So no, I have. Oh, speaking of agents, can I? I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna break the rules real quick. Give a quick plug for my brother, who is an actor, <laughs> and he has a film that just came out yesterday called "The Last Laugh," and it's a uh, it's a slasher film, and it's on Amazon Prime, and you can rent it for four dollars. So there you go. Dope. Steve Vanderzee, look him up, Steve. folks. Okay. Good old anyway. Steve Vanderzee. It's Enough the Frank here. Stallone of the Provokers. <laughs> 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 yes all right anyway um he plays bathroom corpse too <laughs> <laughs> so um the uh last year i've been yeah just trying to make videos mostly and like raise kids <laughs> um and keep my sanity so um yeah it's been it's been really good but uh i've definitely slowed down on the map making i know a lot of people know me for that and i still try to make mapping videos but in terms of the map commissions i'm definitely like slow down on that just to try to bring um you know some yeah just to try to focus on uh, prioritize certain things right right and um so still doing a little bit here and there but that's slow down uh and yeah just trying to put out videos and follow my my whims the videos I've, I've kind of come to peace with this idea that like my channel, although people know me for maps, like I can't stick to one thing. Like I have to follow my heart in the moment. Totally. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and so I, like, I got a 3d printer and I've been 3d printed minis and just, you know, I'm just following with the, the, the muse. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, uh, I'm, I'm teaching, uh, we're, I'm, I'm back to full time teaching this year actually. Cause they, we had to reduce class size because of COVID <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so that's interesting, teaching with masks and social distancing and washing our hands and spraying hand sanitizer in each other's eyes every five yeah. minutes. You just have like a guy in a hazmat suit that comes by with like a hose of hand sanitizer, just mm -hmm. sprays everybody down. That's right. We There's all just like stand up and raise our hands. Loused. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. looks like the, uh, <laughs> the crew from Monsters, Inc. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, so far it's going all right. You know, we have no confirmed COVID cases, and I'm sure there are lots of asymptomatic carriers walking around. And, <laughs> um, and uh, but no, I think masks work. Hey guys, yeah, news flash. I think they mask work. Up. Mask up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope you stay uh, healthy, Nate, as you uh, get back into the teaching groove, man. Oh, and who are Me you too. playing tonight? Who is your character? Oh yes, uh, Sander Nanara. A uh, I think he's a halfling, if I remember correctly, <laughs> <laughs> and he's a monk, and uh, he is, um, you know, I guess uh, thoughtful, conscientious, quick-footed little ninja type. There we go. 
and he's a straight up cold blooded killer as well. Killer. That was also the that thing. Yeah. Uh, and last but certainly not least, Mr. Tim Carney. What have you been up to over the last year, my friend? Uh, so um, we have been uh, re imagining tabletop terrors with a new member so jeff doty has joined tabletop terrors and has definitely uh, raised the bar um so we have a lot of new videos we haven't missed a week yet so there are yeah, new videos from tabletop Ta- yeah and it's thanks to jeff honestly he does all of our editing and so um yeah so check out tabletop terrors there are tons of new videos um and then through absolute tabletop we finished and released the pdf for a dead man's guide to dragon grin that is essentially not only is that all that i was doing but it is also one of the main reasons why we stopped playing provokers it's because <laughs> me barker matt we're all like hey we don't have the time to spare um we used every possible minute <laughs> up to the release yeah. of the book so um but we're very proud of that book. I am very proud of how cool it was to watch these guys and a lot of other really, really talented freelancers take Dragon Grin and make it into something that I could have never made um, for myself. So here is one of the things that I'm going to encourage everyone to do. Either go to absolutetabletop.com or go to, because I'm not going to ask you to buy something. I'm going to ask you to download something that's almost 100 pages and is entirely free either on drive through RPG or our website, the character creation rules to make a dragon grin character are yep. 100% free 72 pages, including a world primer and a bunch of lore and a lot of just awesome art by a lot of awesome artists. So that is what I would say. And uh, I'm really excited to say, Matt, what have you been up to in the last year? Oh, I was not expecting this. This, I was not prepared for this. Um, so I've also been working on A Dead Man's Guide to Dragon Grin. That's taken up a good amount of my time. I was a uh, chief layout artist on the book. So the book is nearly 500 pages, and many of those pages were laid out by me, and the rest of them were laid out by Mr. Michael Barker down here. He was a huge help. Uh, so I did a lot of that, um, and I also went uh, completely full-time uh freelance and tabletop games this year which is a really incredible milestone for me something i've been wanting to do for a long time and uh it just sort of worked out this year and um very fortunate in that a lot of my uh clients still are getting plenty of projects uh in the pipeline even with everything going on so work has remained fairly steady for me so uh yeah i've been doing stuff with green ronin uh cubicle seven I uh, recently started contracting with uh, our Telsorian Games, working on some Witcher stuff for them. So lots of lots of fun, awesome stuff happening for me. Uh, and you should keep an eye out for my name in your favorite RPGs as an editor. And, and we're an uh, Onyx Path publishing book coming Onyx out. Path. And have yep. both of our names in it. Yes, is, yeah. The really first awesome. non-AbTab product to have two AbTab people in it is coming out. Uh, That's really cool. They came from beyond the grave. Just uh, two more to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew hey, Dawkins we're... checks off on a he, yeah. clipboard. Yes. This is going <laughs> faster than I'd anticipated. He's like, hmm, <laughs> two absolute tabletop members and two provokers. Hmm. I wonder which Dawkins. one I will complete first. <laughs> Thanks, man. I can do it if I'm not thinking about it. Um, yeah, the other... I, can't, I can't do it. Tim does the better one. The uh, the other thing I was going to say that I'm very, very excited about, in addition to Arker's Vault and A Dead Man's Guide to Dragon Grin, is that we are going to have some more mecha hack come out this year. Yes. Yep. And we're currently I working on that. So jazzed. We were writing some missions this week that I'm just like, oh, this is going to be so much fun to run. So yeah. Yeah. I'm very excited. Yeah. So lots of fun stuff coming down the pipe for Absolute Tabletop. And uh, yeah, I'm just excited to be like tossing provokers back on the schedule as well, along with all that other cool stuff. So um, yeah, thank you everyone for being here with us. We almost 50 viewers right now, which is uh, 
that's really cool. Thank you for being here. I hope that all of you are uh, staying safe and healthy in this tumultuous time of ours. And I hope that uh, as you sit back, relax, and watch our game tonight, that you are able to get away for a bit and think about something uh, <laughs> a little bit lighter, like, you know, war and fascism in a fantasy world instead of the real world. So uh, we're going to do a little recap here, and then we're going to jump into the game and uh, I'm very excited. Oh, Tim, did you introduce your character? No, and I thought about it after, oh. and I thought I'm not going to interrupt Matt to do it. So you, you ding dong. Who are you playing? I am playing Kristoff Stormraven, the errant druid who is uh, finding his powers and coming into his own and trying to fill the shoes of uh, his brother who was murdered. And so having the resolution for that, I'm excited to see uh, what... Christoph's focus is going to be now. Awesome. Yep. All right. So, last time in 2019 on the Provokers, the Provokers were uh, in the Ravenstorm Highlands in the north of Aranoth. And in fact, if you look at the map off to my, off this, off this way, if you look at the map, the Ravenstorm Highlands are that little patch of forest there uh, just beneath the island of Shale. Uh, the Ravenstorm Highlands are the homeland of uh, Kristoff Stormraven. And the Provokers journeyed here uh, through a portal that they found in Sonageist, uh, one of these uh, whispering doors that have become sort of a uh, reoccurring element of their adventure. Uh, once through, they met a, <laughs> I almost said like classic provoker, <laughs> but that's what he is, Erdon Saroshent, uh, who had been waging a solo guerrilla war against the criminal faction known as the Clerisy, who had occupied the Ravenstorm Highlands. Uh, the new provokers joined up with Erdon in his crusade, and after attacking a Mitsurium mine and freeing some uh, slaves who had been put to work there, uh, they uh, then continued and uh, ambushed a caravan, uh, a clerisy caravan. Uh, they uh, struck against this caravan hauling process Mitsurium alongside Armand Ironborough, who was someone they had saved from the mine uh, and who was an old friend of Kristoff's brother, Nero. Uh, they confiscated the Mitsurium as well as some clerisy uniforms from these downed enemies. Um, Holly, though, had sustained an injury from Bronze Eyes, the devilish ruler of the Clerisy, and this injury continued to plague her throughout last session, um, almost supernaturally affecting her, and we'll, we'll see some more of that uh, in a little bit here. Uh, Armand also confided in Kristoff, uh, revealing to him that uh, he and Nero were good childhood friends, and Armand told Kristoff that Nero would be proud of the man he had become. Uh, once back at camp, Erdon revealed to the Provokers that after a final strike against the Clerisy here in the Ravenstorm Highlands, that he would be going his separate way to uh, make good on a favor that he owed to an old friend. That night, appearing in a dream, Bronze Eyes spoke to Holly and offered her a deal. If Holly were to steal the sphere from Sander and bring it to Bronze Eyes, Bronze Eyes would release the goddess he calls the Exile and usher in a new world free of war. In doing this, Holly asked that her stepfather, Dice, would be released from his imprisonment within the Bleak. Holly was conflicted. She reasons that in this new world, perhaps more children would grow up like Edric did, hearing stories of war rather than living it. She took this fear on a nat 20 sleight of hand versus a nat 1 perception, I might add, and fled into the woods. Erdon, though, appeared to her and attempted to stop her from fleeing. She eventually saw the error in trusting Bronze Eyes. She held up her owl figurine, Nimbus, this uh, artifact gifted to her by Atma, the spirit archon, and she received a vision of her friends, the provokers, the losses that they had suffered together, and the joys that they had celebrated. She realized that these were one and the same, and that 
Along with the bad had come much good. She returned the sphere to Sander. After this moment of uh, conflict, the provokers planned their attack against the Clarissy outpost. They would pose as the lost caravan crew donning the uniforms of the officers they had downed. And there at the outpost, they met Phil Rissett, a tiefling commander of the Clarissy. Phil, though, was pretty clever and didn't buy the ruse, and a battle quickly broke out. Kristoff, though, was quick, and along with a couple of arrows from Eridon, dispatched Thil with his, uh, with his bleak iron dagger. Uh, with their leader dead, the rest of the clerisy surrendered to the provokers, and the war in the Ravenstorm Highlands ended. The clerisy had been ousted, finally, from Kristoff's home. But just when it seemed the day had been won, a bleak storm appeared quite suddenly, and an eight-foot-tall horned construct seemingly made of Mitsurium stepped through the storm. It charged at the provokers, and that is where I left you last time. I'm sorry about that. I forgive you. (laughs) All right. Let's find out what happens next. None of you remember much. You remember the construct stepping through. You remember the storm fading behind it. You remember the sound it made, like metal scraping against stone, mingled with a shrill scream as it charged. You remember that it formed a massive axe from its own body. And then you remember pain, desperation, smoke, fire. A battle the likes of which none of you have seen. You remember seeing your friends topple you remember seeing them fall, bloody and battered. Erdon, too, was there, loosing arrows into this thing desperately. And then you remember something descending from the sky, blotting out the sun. And then darkness took you. Kristoff, you wake to pain in your head, pain in your ribs. As you make to sit up, you feel stitches in your side. You realize one of your eyes is closed. There's a hum beneath you, something droning. You reach out, you feel wood, cloth, iron studs. You recognize the hum. You're inside the sable, the leva ship. It's dark, but you can see sunlight cutting through the planks on the hull of the ship. As far as you can tell, you are alone. What do you do? With the piercing ring in my ears, it's difficult to hear the familiar thrum of the sable at first, but as the ring subsides, I absentmindedly stand up without balance and stagger. Where would I feel it hurt the most as I put weight onto my legs? I think uh, your left leg would would hold weight. Your right one would start to buckle beneath you, though, and you would realize that there's something broken, and you feel that there is a splint there 
holding your leg in place. And I would scream and clutch the the leg immediately. And I would say, Keenra's bath water. <laughs> and as I fall against the side of where I was standing, <clears throat> I feel like my eyes start to adjust. Can I open my other eye? You can, uh, though it is um, pretty uh, painful to do so. It sends a, a bit of a pain lancing through your head. Okay. And so I I close it again. <sighs> it's not worth it. And it's, it's just blurry water and pain. Just, ah. So then I just go, yeah. Anybody else here? You hear a groan in response. Sander, you wake similarly, feeling pain swelling in your head, trouble even opening your eyes, and as you do so, the dim light that's in here cuts into your eyes and splits your head again. One of your arms is bound in a splint but you hear a familiar voice in the darkness Christoph's what do you do I keep my eyes closed but I I call his name Christoph is it you it's me Sandy where are we oh it's the sable I can hear it now the others are they here and I look around and do I see I I don't know if maybe all I see is bright white but I'm looking for the others you actually feel something shift beside you something massive It, it rolls and you just see this broad body sort of almost eclipsing the light above you, Sander, and you realize it's Edric, and he's struggling to come up on his hands and knees. Edric, you feel bruised ribs. You take a breath, and you feel fluid in your lungs. You see Sander, though your vision is blurry, and you can hear Kristoff. Uh, I think that uh, I would try and stand up, even though I know deep in my heart that I can't, but I'll still make the effort. And standing up, I managed to try and like raise my body just the slightest bit until I realized, no, no, ground better, ground better, ground, I know the ground. And... Uh, I go back down onto the ground. Oh, everything hurts, Mr. Sander. Is Mr. Kristoff and Miss Ollie here too? Kristoff <laughs> is, is here. Holly? I don't... I don't you know. Don't hear. You don't hear Holly. She's not here with you. Edric, lay back down. Lay back down. Oh, don't have to tell me twice. Oh. And I'll, yeah, I, I pretty much lay down, um, coughing a lot. And, and I, uh, I use the, uh, the the broadest part of your body, your your chest heaving up and down, although pained. I kind of roll as close as I can to you for a little bit of shade from the sunlight. <laughs> so you're, you're resting your head on my heaving bosom? No. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm resting my head to your side. Ah, ah, because, you know, <laughs> wide shade. bosom, wide bosom. Uh, you know, you know a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of farm work there. <laughs> Bosoms. 
<laughs> farm work does make for a wide bosom. I know that. Uh, you, all three of you, as you're sort of getting your bearings and fighting your way through this haze of pain, you hear voices muffled up on the deck above you, and you hear creaking as somebody walks across the deck towards the front of the ship, and dust kind of filters down through the rays of sunlight. Christoph, can you see who it is? Up there. I, I think I would try to open my eye again out of reflex and just sort of wince in pain as all I see is just the blurry stream. Uh, and <clears throat> I would, would I be able to see who this is or is it just merely a silhouette and the creaking? Your eyes have to adjust a little bit to the sunlight that's, that's uh, seeping through the upper deck, but eventually you catch sight of two silhouettes one of them uh this kind of slouching robed silhouette that's kind of crouching down and the other one is this tall slender silhouette and you can see a quiver of arrows on their back looks like Erdon. okay and so i would i would say to sandra i'd go oh, sandy it looks like Erdon and what looks like the skeevy slouch of kinra <laughs> I just want to sleep forever. But I'm going to try to make my way up there. Hello? Sander, it takes you a little bit to get up onto the deck. You have to climb a ladder to get up there, which is uh, not easy with one arm and a splint, but you manage to do so, and as you come up on the deck, the sunlight just, it's almost audible how bright it is. Like just, and your head is just ringing. But you manage to pull your hood up and kind of shade yourself as much as possible. And you do, in fact, see Erdon, who's turning to look at you. And you can see that Erdon is injured as well, though less so than the three of you down below. Uh, one arm is in a sling against his body and uh he has a cut on the side of his face that uh looks like it was quickly stitched he says good you're awake the other's okay i don't know there we seem to have woken each other up or something woke us all up i don't know but uh they're not dead we're not oh. dead where is holly he steps aside. She's all right. And you can see that Keenra is slouched over Holly, who is uh, unconscious on the deck. And you see that her abdomen is open. And Keenra is kind of fishing around in there with his claws. And he goes, I've almost got it. I just need one more moment. Do you trust him, Erdan? No. <laughs> no. Um, uh, Christoph. Uh. And you would see that I'm already sort of like <clears throat> limping up the, <clears throat> you know, to, to, to join you. And I kind of uh, maybe two steps behind you. I'd be like, ah. And so he is, is there blood or is this uh, magical or? There's quite a bit of blood. This is like some some barber surgeon uh, shit going on here. <laughs> Does, okay, so is, is Holly conscious? She is not. She is not conscious. And so I think immediately Kristoff would be terrified and hide it and of course mask it with some sort of a joke and so i would kind of step up as though i was watching be like that's some dirty spaghetti (laughs) (laughs) 
Do you have inspiration that I could take away for that line? <laughs> <laughs> spaghetti for the Pope. It's spaghetti for the Pope. For the Pope. Uh, let's hold on. No, I don't. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, you have my, yeah. negative one inspiration. Okay, then. I'll put it on the sheet. Cool. Uh, Keenra suddenly goes, got it. And you hear this wet sort of like pop as he pulls out what looks like a tiny little shard of black steel. Mm, and I say, and there's the meatball. <laughs> Negative two. Spaghetti very, cannon I, and Aronoff. I, I'm <laughs> <laughs> and apparently they have a Pope. Yeah, apparently, apparently have a Pope too. Spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> Keenra holds up this piece of metal. A gift from your new devilish friend. He kind of drops it into a, a bowl and it does that when they pull the bullet out of the guy in the movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, Keenra very quickly sets to stitching the wound back up. It would not have killed her today, but it would have someday. How are you three feeling? Been better. You've been asleep for a week. Even if you weren't injured, you wouldn't feel good when you woke up. And I think I would call after Edric and I'd be like, you hear that, Ed? It's time to get up. You've been asleep for a week. You overslept by a full week. Uh, well, well, do I have to? Uh, everything hurts. I feel like I've been kicked in my soul by a horse or something. Ow. Uh, <laughs> and I'll probably slowly kind of get up. Um you know, suddenly like getting up, like, you know, uh, uh, well, like, like me, like how I get up, you know, with, the, uh, uh, oh, uh, you know, like a 40 year old guy would get up. Um, I kind of begin to kind of slowly meander my way. Uh, and uh, the sun, of course, it just like just everything just kind of hurts. You know, that like when you wake up, and your your whole body is sensitive to everything light sound um you know your cat everything and it's just uh, is, is miss holy all right yeah. keenra says she is now and he cu he cuts the stitching thread with his teeth oh good what happened? I, I I thought we were we were we were in a in a fight, uh, and 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 then we got hurt. But how did we get here? I went looking for you. It is fate, fortune, serendipity that I came upon you when I did. I saw a bleak storm on the horizon, decided to head for it. The scene I found when I arrived. At least one of you was dead before I got there. But we worked quickly, used up the reserves of my healing drafts. We brought you back from the brink. That thing you fought, what do you remember about it? I remember it was big. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it, 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 wasn't it made out of some sort of a metal? A very special kind of metal. I think that... Well, it, it, it pulled out a we- No, it didn't pull out a weapon. It, it made a weapon. Right? From, from itself? Isn't that right, Mr. Sander? It, it just... Right. That's right. It's just, it's just so fuzzy. It was some kind of... Golem or construct or... Magical blob of terror. I don't want to remember. Is she awake? And I point to Holly. She's starting to uh, stir. She'll be awake soon. uh, Sorry. I I was going to say that uh, Kristoff would go over to Holly and uh, start so, sort of like unceremoniously like rifling through uh, pockets and saying like, did she have any rations? I am starving. But what I'm really doing is sneakily uh, casting healing word. <laughs> but, mm. but I'm not letting anyone know that's what I'm doing. I'm making it look like I'm actually taking her food or like, oh, rifling around for, does she have any rations left? Kainra's like, there are barrels of fish right over here. I, I stocked the sable well before we left. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm uh, pretty starving. Thanks. It starts to snow as the sable continues coasting. You feel a chill on the air, and you're in the clouds, and it's difficult to see the landmass below you, but you can definitely feel that you're more north of where you were in the highlands. Keenra touches a scaled hand to Holly's face. She's waking. Um, somebody get some alcohol ready. She's going to be hurting quite a bit. I just pulled the tip of a spear from her abdomen. Alcohol, where, which Erdon kind of moves over and starts to lift a barrel and then goes, mm. nope, I can't lift that. Uh, here, there's some in here, Sander. All right. And um, I move to help him. Um, actually, I probably would like find a, a, a cup or a bottle or mug or something or water skin <laughs> and go to fill it. You do so, and uh, you bring it over to Holly, and Holly, the first thing you feel is snow on your face. You feel these cold little, just like, almost like someone's pressing their fingertip against your face as snowflakes are falling. And then you feel this intense, kind of searing burn in your abdomen, uh, which... Were it not for that, you'd likely be more aware of the other injuries you sustained. But that's the chief thing that you feel as you wake. Holly, almost without realizing it, says, I'm dead. And she sits up, ah, stops herself, lays back down, looks up, sees Kinra, and I'm in hell. <laughs> and then she spits out a glottal of blood. And then realizes where they are. Why is it snowing? Erdon speaks up. Oh, of course I'm muted. Erdon speaks up. We're flying over the charwood. We're heading north. The charwood, that's... I've only heard stories... Let me... Easy, easy. Aerodon comes over. You won't be able to see it anyway. It's too cloudy. Shit. 
What was that thing? Eridon looks to the other three provokers and then back to you, Holly. We're not sure. She examines the the her ribs where she was struck with that spear and sees the stitching. Holy what what happened? Bronze eyes left part of the spear inside of you. Did you take it out? He lifts up the bowl and shows you the little shard. I did. She grabs the bowl and examines it. Ah! Does that mean it'll heal? It will heal. It will take some time. A wound like that from a magic weapon doesn't heal like other ones. But it won't kill you. If we had left the shard, you wouldn't have lasted long. She reaches up with her right hand after a moment and grasps Kinra by, sh- by the shoulder. I imagine she's sitting down with her back to the, the boat and he's kind of kneeling in front of her. And she puts her hand on his shoulder and she remembers uh, the Dusk District uh, back at Falhas. She remembers the many times that Kinra was battered by the blood guard or by the Black Bloods and uh, times that she was responsible for such payment for his misdeeds, as we would call them. But now she sees something different. She looks up and glances at Eridon of the Honorable Shadevale and back down to Kinra. Thank you. Thank you. Kinra is not sure what to do with that. He kind of gets this look on his face like literally nobody has ever thanked him for anything in his life. And he just sort of like nods awkwardly and sort of like pulls his shoulder away from your hand and says, "Mm, I didn't want to have to deal with tossing your body overboard. Plus, I would have had to answer to these three. You couldn't have lifted it anyway. (laughs) No, I probably could not have. I'm older than I look. He says as he gets up and you see his like stooped, like stunted form. That's impossible. As uh, Erdon said, we are heading north. I spent much of my time while you were in the highlands researching. You didn't leave me with much, but I, I had a bit to go on. He like unrolls this piece of cloth and you see the rotting draconic arm of Casimir Strongsong. I trust you remember this. I've been um, running some tests. I've told you before, it is of the bleak. That sphere you carry, he looks to Sander, I trust you still have it. Do I? I don't remember. You, you do. You okay. do have it. Thank the gods, you still have it. Yeah. You didn't um, for a little bit last session, but now it's it's back. All right. Yes. And I look down. Um, it's still here. Pouch around my waist. Well, I, I found this. He kind of comes forward and he brushes a bunch of uh, garbage and used medical supplies and bandages and stuff. I did. I did, I did just hear like a ding, like the doors open on an elevator. Again, that's my speaker, that's, guys. Oh, that's Facebook Messenger. That's the Facebook oh, Messenger. Oh, that's track. the Facebook <laughs> Messenger. Yep. Okay. I have a, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't trust elevators in Provokers games. <laughs> it's a long time. You're like, you're like, oh, oh, you like <laughs> instantly go into fight or flight mode. <laughs> Uh, it, was, it was my fault. I actually sent a photo in the provokers chat. Oh, okay. It's gotcha. true. Uh, Keen Rob brushes all of these bandages and stuff off of this, uh, this crate in the middle of the deck of the sable. And he unrolls this scroll and he kind of shows you this piece of art, uh, Sander. And you can see that it is depicting 
a battle that took place during the Great Scorching, and you can see this uh, this armored figure atop a griffin, uh, and this figure is holding aloft this sphere, and light is emanating from the sphere, and all of these dragon kind are sort of shielding themselves from the light. It's this very like biblical looking uh, piece of art, um, and Kinra says. The sphere is incomplete. It is broken. You've noticed, I assume. Yes. <clears throat> it's looks very old. <laughs> like like many of the things we find in Sonnegeist buried in the desert. It is a powerful relic in its own right, but incomplete it remains. I did some digging. The piece, this um, shard of the sphere that is missing, I believe I know where it is. He looks at Erdon, and I also think Iskandar knows where it is. Well, that's bad news. But is there a chance we can beat him there? Is that where we are headed? Yes. Eras is buried in Snarholm in the mountains. There's a tomb there, a vault, where he is laid to rest. The legends say he died there fighting Alasvesh the winged death, the ice dragon. You've all heard the stories. He kind of looks to all of you. He looks to Edric. Come on. Uh, well, uh, I mean, I, I don't really know. Uh, did the provokers face the ice dragon? I always forget that your area of expertise is limited to the last 25 years of history. Well, I'm, I mean, I, I'm only 17, so... Right. Eros, the Reclaimer. He started the Convocation. You're familiar with the Convocation, I assume. Eros, the Reclaimer, spent his life fighting dragons. And he died fighting a dragon. He was laid to rest in the mountains where it happened. And that's where we're heading. We're going to need our strength. We should, we should eat. You should eat and you should rest. We're still a few days out from Snarholm, but it's going to be a cold trip, especially this high up. We have to stay in the clouds. Um, we don't want to run into any gray wing patrols. They're bad news, believe me. Well then, uh, is there? I'm not now. I'm not 100 percent sure. <clears throat> On the sable, is there like a br a brazier or something we can use to like light a fire and kind of try and keep warm? Yeah. Or? So the actually the uh, the sort of central area of the uh, where the like the engine, for lack of a better phrase, is where the skier stones are for navigating this thing. Uh, it's actually really warm and it kind of doubles as like a furnace, and so you can kind of gather around it and. It kind of radiates with this energy and you can kind of get heat from it and it um it goes down through all three decks so it like heats every every deck of the ship okay um well then i uh i suppose we should probably try and keep warm uh, maybe a few of us kind of walk the deck a few times to make sure we're not being followed or something Erdon um, says, I can keep an eye out, and I'm in much better shape than all of you. I'm also not going to Snarholm. I threw a, threw a mouthful of uh, fish that he's eating from the barrels, probably this delicious, like, smoked something very good. 
Uh, Christoph goes, Ream, ream. I said before, once the clerisy was ousted from the highlands, we were going our separate ways. I got you all to safety. You're all alive. I have a promise to keep to an old friend. Hmm. Fair enough. That said, this likely won't be the last time I see you all. Well, you no, know, we're pretty good at being seriously hurt or killed. You are at that. Next time it happens, I hope I show up after the fight, not during. Well, we'll, we'll miss you. And thank you for all your help. I know it sounds cliche to say, but truly, it is I who should be thanking you. I fought against the clerisy for years in the Highlands, and I wasn't able to strike a decisive blow against them until you four showed up. The Highlands are free of the clerisy. He looks to Kristoff. Your home is free. Yes, free free of the clerisy. And, you know, thinking of myself, my past with the clerisy and my role in probably, not actively, but taking part in things that were thwarting what Erdon was trying to stop, uh, you know, and I, I sort of get lost in that thought and trail off and then... Uh, uh, Rast, do you want some of this fish? No, for some reason I feel I feel like I'm stuffed. <laughs> what I'd uh like from all of you is uh go ahead and describe one scene from this uh montage as the Leva ship uh, completes its trip across the northern portion of Aranoth and arrives in the mountains of Snarholm. Uh, what do you do to rest, recuperate? Um, what sorts of conversations do you have? Um, we can start with... Uh, let's go ahead and start with Tim on, uh, on the right. I think <clears throat> that I would be really meditating on our time with the Archon and how we were just dead. I was probably dead. And having some time alone with that thought when we f settle in and have those quiet moments to ourselves is Christoph realizes that if it wasn't for someone else in that moment, that he'd be dead and he'd be a failure because he wasn't good enough. And so without showing it to others, in fact, I would probably actively look like I was being lazy, but I would get up in the night and I would practice druidic magic and I would practice wild shape and I would practice these, these things, but I would, I would never let it show but I'm trying to become better because that thing is still out there and I won't let it kill me again. So I think that there's a mixture of, of training late nights, but looking like I'm slouching around eating fish most of the trip. Great. Uh, Nate, what about Sander? Sanders spending an awful lot of time with um, the orb and just kind of checking on it <laughs> and um, and just kind of looking at it and getting a little lost in thought. Um, and definitely every time Holly's around, he he puts it away. Um, not because he is afraid she'll take it again. Um, 
but because it's awkward and he doesn't want her to feel uncomfortable. Um, Did Sander, I don't think Holly knows that Sander knows. Oh, okay. And I, so think, I think if Sander you know, only maybe suspects because he noticed that his bag was, the bag had was, been messed with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. And Holly's okay. weird around it. So I, I think that Sander's onto something, but Holly wouldn't realize <laughs> okay. it. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. And I also didn't remember if we'd like, and maybe a quick refresher, did we, yeah, no, no, I guess that that question is irrelevant then too. Okay. Um, yeah. So he's just spending an awful lot of time uh, doing that. And then I think, um, you know, just trying to <laughs> stretch and stay um, limber while being on a fairly small vessel is, is uh, something that he's concerning himself with too. Weird. It wasn't letting me unmute myself for a second there. I was like, oh no. Uh, Mike, what about Edric? What's Edric up to in the uh, couple days that you have here? I think Edric would probably take uh, a few shifts more than anyone else just patrolling the deck. Um, even even, uh, <clears throat> even if uh, uh, it would mean being cold. Um, you know, I, I think I would be trying to just wrap my head around uh, what happened. Did I fail? Did I fail everyone else? And <clears throat> just trying to wrap my head around also loss, just loss of battle, loss of fighting. You know, am I, am I, do I really deserve to be called a provoker? Should I even call myself? And a lot of these things I think are weighing heavily on, on Edric, you know, like being young and, and <clears throat> realizing that mortality is a bit more, well, mortal than, than the, you know, legends of, of song. And I think uh, also like probably during the night maybe, or when everyone else is busy, uh, I would be taking out my pole axe and, uh, and just practicing, um, you know, attacking dreaded buckets or uh, or anything else that was nearby to try and uh, and uh, and and basically like kind of keep into fighting for him. and barker what about holly she would probably have the toughest recovery of the bunch uh, having had a kind of backwoods surgery on a leva ship yeah, her montage is all taking place in uh, this her quarters aboard the ship, and she's staring. She's sitting with her back to the wall on her bed, and she's holding her uh, blood guard rank insignia in her hand, and just kind of looking at it, the tattered cloth from where she tore it from her uniform. And Erdon comes in and sits at the foot of her bed and they speak about something. And she smiles and he leaves. Then later on, you see her and Erdon practicing meditation together. Erdon teaches her uh, how to focus. And she struggles with the pain of her healing wound. But over time, after Erdon brings her water in the room, and they continue this practice at the end of this montage she's meditating on the bed herself her palms outward and raised up and at the center of her palm this faintest faintest fiery light just manifests for a moment and she opens her eyes Everyone go ahead and uh, give yourselves a point of inspiration. Uh, that squares me off to zero. Thank Perfect. You. Great. Wait, hold on. You didn't get a negative one for the meatball? <laughs> oh. I was I was hoping you'd make a marinara blood comment. Yeah, and then no, that way, in, the charm, now he gains an inspiration for all three in, of those. You're in debt and it's interest too. So, <laughs> Ed, dude, Mitsurium spaghetti. The, the APR on this uh, inspiration debt is not good either, Tim. So The APR, not even like in these times, in yeah. these hey, hey, unprecedented you know what? times. 
I, I can loan you. I can loan you like three points of inspiration. I mean, uh, I'll do a good, I'll do, I'll do much better than, 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 than that. You know? it, Mike, it sounds like you're playing provoker season one where inspiration wasn't a have it or don't. We were stacking them up by the sevens. Oh, funny enough. You should mention. Yes, I, I do. I got like seven, which I'll use eventually. Eventually. Eventually, on the last on the last combat of the last session of Provoker's yeah. Bleak Wrath, Mike's I would like just gonna to, spam all yeah. the inspiration. It's like, I would like I have to advantage. Yeah, I would like to I use didn't all crit. of I'm gonna the try her again. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't crit. If that's I, a I, okay. That's a 19 on the. Do- uh, you know what? I'll go ahead and spend an inspiration uh, in yeah. case I get a 20. Can I, can I humble bundle to get yeah. automatic? Uh, <laughs> just automatic crits. We're the one percent. Yeah. Porting all the inspiration. You can actually, yeah, it's you have offshore inspiration accounts. Oh my god, yeah, some spicy inspiration jokes. Accounts. Spicy oh jokes. Um, on the third day of uh, travel, conscious Sorry. travel, you uh, descend through the clouds. Um, Keen Ra's gotten pretty good at maneuvering the sable around. He's not pulling any like Tokyo Drift maneuvers or anything, but he can he can go up and down and and change course if he needs to and adjust the sails. Um, he if <laughs> sorry, Barker got me in the chat. It's Provokers, baby. We're back. Uh, Keen Ra maneuvers the the sable down through the the layer of clouds and. You can see uh, this like beautiful vista. It's it's you see Aranoth. Um before you. You see these uh, these frozen tundras and hills. Um, behind you is a blackened forest, the Charwood. This place that was once lush and green, and whose destruction ushered in a new era for Northern Aranoth. Off to the west, you can see mountains. And beyond that, the barest silhouette of Viator, the floating isles. You see these mountains aloft, and you see them kind of clustered and almost orbiting around each other in this slow sort of movement. You've all heard tales of the Wandering Isles and how this is where Griffin's roost and where the convocation was founded. You've never set eyes upon them before. And just as soon as they appear, they're gone as Kinra continues descending and they're blotted out by the mountains in the distance. To the north, though, there's a sheer wall of mountain. Just these towering, skyscraping stone formations. These mountains that look like they were pulled from the ground by some titanic godlike creature, and maybe they were. You you don't know. These are the tallest mountains in Aranoth, and you know that beyond, on the other side, is the Everfrost, the tundra that stretches on for unknown leagues. The country that you set down in is known as Karn. And as you descend just low enough, Eridon stands at the gangplank. He's got his bag over his shoulder, his bow unstrung. He turns, and there's a a weariness, this kind of age that shows through for a second. And elves don't age, but you can see... Erdon has. He nods to you all and says, Until next time. Wait, Holly says. And she walks over to Erdon. And she gives him a hug. And she says, Thanks for everything in a very subtle voice that only people who were trying to hear would hear, uh, thinking, hearkening back to the dream of bronze eyes and 
her choosing the right path. She knows she wouldn't have done it without him. He grips your shoulder, Holly, and you just feel the, the strength in his arm as he does so. And he says, we're going to get him back. I promise. And then he steps off the sable, falling probably farther than a normal person should. And you see him land, tuck, and roll as he does so. And then the sable continues on, and Kinra begins gaining altitude. And you just see this shape of Eridon Saroshint standing on the tundra below, bag over his shoulder. He waves, and then you see him turn and walk in the other direction, soon disappearing through the mist. Again, the sable climbs through the clouds, and soon enough you find yourself approaching these mountains. You see their peaks uh, poking up through the layer of clouds. Keenra says, All right, what do you all know of Snarholm? I'd like to think that we all just look to Edric at the same time. I don't know. If we don't know, I don't know. Holly doesn't know anything about no, it. Sander, don't my... look to him. The provokers didn't go there, so he doesn't know. <laughs> well, there there might have been a story about the provokers when they did fight a, a powerful ice demon in the frozen tundras somewhere. I think I heard that once. Oh, it was a good song. Was that it, maybe? That definitely did not happen, no. No. Um, Are you sure? Because it sounds like you were there, but I don't know if you actually were there. I wasn't there for all of it, but I was there for most of it, and that, okay, that definitely well, did not happen. Well, then you, if you were there for most of it, but not all of it, then perhaps they did go to, to snurf a blim. The war for the for the Western Southlands lasted like a month, and there wouldn't have been time for them to go up north where it was snowy and then come back down in well, time mean, to be at the Siege of Falhast, right, which right, is when but, I saw them but, again. True, but Dice Ellington is a very powerful wizard, and he I'm is, pretty but sure he that— did not have access to any sort of teleportation magic— at that point. So you know, I mean, to be quite honest, there's a very good chance that he could, like, could have not have just told you about whatever sort of powerful magic. Look, I am if, not going to... Are we really going to do this? If Dice had access to teleportation magic, why would they have needed the Ring of Three Strides from me in order to teleport? God, are we still talking about Marvel? I don't even know anymore. <laughs> that was the best thing ever. That was great. <laughs> Sander has some popcorn right now. Yeah, I couldn't do it. The... I like. I, I was like. I'm like. Hold it Edric, together, Mike. Edric's on hold the air off wiki on his phone. <laughs> it says right here. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. Uh, I was I, waiting for one of you to break the meta and be yep, like, yeah. "No, I I'm telling yeah, you, he no. was like level six. There's no way he would have had a teleportation spell. <laughs> like maybe Misty Step at most, and that's like but what thirty feet. He couldn't he, have he, gone up to the north. He he could have gotten it as a scroll. You don't know. You know, there's lots of treasure lying around. I love that Kinra says the the war lasted like a month. <laughs> yeah, 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 dude. I lost it immediately when you go. No, that definitely did not happen. <laughs> uh, <God>. yeah. <clears throat> no, you got me. You, you definitely got me. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't keep it together. Uh, Keenra and Edric argue for a little while longer before Keenra says, it, 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 "It's not important. Uh, Snarholm is. Uh, it's ruled by dwarves. Um, it is a place of uh, hard people, harsh environs." The dwarves of Snarholm, they live inside a volcano, which is pretty stupid if you ask me, but they've lived there for a long time and the volcano hasn't erupted, so what do I know? But they utilize the magma to heat their homes, forge their weapons. They use it like others use water or lightning in the case of Stone Rift. They're isolated, remote. They don't get out much. In fact, the only dwarf I've ever met from Snarholm is Rorsch. 
one of the uh, co-owners of the Wayward Wanderer. If you seek entrance into the Vault of Eros, which I think is where we will find our shard, you must treat with them first. They are the keepers of his tomb. Yes, we we knew none of that. Well, then I guess it's good that I told you. Well, you are... know these dwarves. Have you dealt with them before? I cannot say that I have. I have never been this far north. I find the cold disagreeable. And Kristoff would sort of look around and basically just say, listen, from my family, I know every area has its customs and every area has what would be considered the right way to enter and the right way to treat. We have to figure that out or we're doomed before we start. This is a fair point. Um, well, have the dwarves, uh, have they ever talked to the other dwarves of, of Stone Rift? Are they allied? Or are they, I don't know, do they prefer to just, have they just only ever stuck out on their own? You know how dwarves are. They tend to keep to themselves, watch after themselves and their own. The dwarves of Snarholm, mm, they are particularly dwarfy, if you'll excuse the expression. They tend to be stubborn, stalwart, proud to a fault. They don't delight in war, but they fight when necessary. They choose their leader by trial rather than election or birthright. Oh! And they've been at constant war with their neighbor, Svelbrig, for a couple of centuries at this point. Well, I'm glad you've just remembered that part now. It didn't seem pertinent at the time. How many wars do you want to get involved in? Well, well it's not about getting involved in. In case one of them stops us and says, excuse me, would you happen to be from the people we've been at war at probably longer than you, your dad, your granddad have been alive? I don't think they'll mistake any of you for a uh, Svelbrig dwarf. Don't worry. <laughs> so, wait. So we're going to... Svelbrig? No, Edric, you're going to Snarholm. Svelbrig is their neighbor, the one they're at war with. Keep up! Are they both dwarves? It, technically, yes. Well, um... Have you ever heard of, uh... Durgar? Dark dwarves. Gesundheit? Durgar. They're called Dark Dwarves, Ice Dwarves. Oh. They dwell in Svelbrig. Oh, I see. They stayed there once they were one nation. But the Dwarves of Svelbrig, they chose to remain in their peak while the Dwarves of Snarholm moved someplace warmer. The ice magic inside Svelbrig is powerful. Supernatural. You have to have heard of Svelbrig. They have a prison there. It's famous. It's where they lock up the worst criminals in Aranoth. Are we really going to go down this conversation again? That I've heard of. Okay, thank you. The He's prison. heard of Svelbrig. Yes. yes. Hmm. The Duergar <laughs> dwell I got a cousin Svelbrig. doing a nickel up in there. No, <laughs> <laughs> Please Doing continue. a nickel. Doing a fiver up there. Uh, Keenra says, It's not vitally important. The war between Snarholm and Svelbrig is as natural as the sun coming up. Well, then, if it is, uh, is there some way that we could use that to our advantage 
a nation at war is a nation with opportunity. I can't say for certain. Again, I've never been to either place, but... Snarhome might be more agreeable if you offered to lend aid. Well, I mean, maybe they'll just want us to do something simple, like gather up some of that lava and and then help them out with that and, and, and maybe build something. They would not trust the outsiders with the blood of the mountain. I that, can assure that... you that. Oh, that's a really ominous take for magma, isn't it? I mean, it's blood of the mountain. I mean, maybe they need to get out or something. Maybe smell a rose or something, you know. Got him. So then, well, I, I guess we would just need to help him then. And, and then we can go to where we need to go you don't remember it's all the names we're no, using it's... all the different names and you don't remember it i can tell by I your do. face no i i <laughs> do i do we have to go to to say it well we're, we're well we're going to snar home okay yeah no we're not yes oh Just you're you. know, after once you're you get... confusing me again <laughs> Where is the, where's the piece of the sphere that you need to get? Where is it? Do you remember I, where that is? Well, it... It's in the... the... vault... Mm -hmm. of... Yes? Eris. Er Eris? Everybody, please give a round of applause to Edric for remembering where you need to go. Thank give you. him a break. The past few weeks feels like a whole year. Well, <laughs> yeah. It's fair. Listen. <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> That's called. It's an extended release joke. That's, is that what? It was, <laughs> it was a gel cap. <laughs> there it is. There it is. It just hit. <laughs> I wish I could offer more help or advice, but they're not going to take kindly to me in Snarholm. They don't like dragons. I'll be sitting this one out, but I trust you all to do what needs to be done a gift instead of sending yourself send us with a gift something that we can present to them it's customary every time my parents went somewhere they would bring a gift mm. i don't really have anything but you seem to have a lot of things i do have a lot of things so maybe there's something that you could part with to ensure our success we offer mm. it up as a gift to show them that we are honorable, giving, and don't want to fight. Uh, what do you think? I do have something. It actually pains me to part with it. He. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> He reaches, be really good. A, he reaches into a, a trunk and he pulls out this like wicked looking axe. This I'm actually afraid to say this because I think Edric might pass out was wielded by one Brasswick Feeblehammer during the war for the Western Southlands. Oh wow. He found it in a troll den. This is a troll cutter. An axe made by dwarves to do one thing very well. Kill trolls. It was likely made here in these mountains, and if you return it to the people of Snarholm, I imagine they would be very grateful indeed. 
It is invaluable. Perfect. That's exactly the value we need. He holds it out. Uh, Christoph would step aside and like point both of his hands toward Edric. Like that, that's a you thing. <laughs> like, well, me, I'm, I'm not me? carrying that. I... Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I'll place my hand, like both hands out. Um, and as if I was like holding someone else's infant for the first time and is equal parts in awe and terrified. Um, but I'm sure all parents have seen that look before. <laughs> <laughs> Take that as a yes. Uh, so yeah, just w- waiting to kind of hold this, uh, this, this battle axe. It is both heavier and lighter than you were anticipating. The weight of it seems perfectly balanced. And in addition to that, it seems like it's forged of one seamless piece of metal. The haft is wrapped in leather and etched with uh, symbols of uh, Ilmater, which you know are likely additions by Brasswick. Keenra says, he gave it to me when he went into his hermitage. He said he wouldn't need it anymore. I was planning on selling it at some point for (sighs) more gold than I can imagine, but this is more worthwhile. Well, I shall look after it carefully, uh, and I'll like sling off my backpack and kind of like very much attach it, like put it on the inside and then attach it to make sure that it is not leaving that pack uh, and then put my pack back on. And if uh, that doesn't do the trick, that spear, he points to the one that's, uh, I assume still strapped to your back, Edric, and the missing piece are both forged of obsidian steel, which they're quite fond of here as well. Well then, we're going to have plenty of gifts. Uh, I guess we should uh, head down? Up? Is there a place to, you know, set this down? Like a... We're not going to set down. You're going to jump off as we pass the mountain. Can you slow down a little bit? No, I'm going to speed up, he says, and then he laughs and says, no, I'll slow down. He uh, he says, uh, gather your things. We're almost there. And he augers this baby in. He, uh, he brings the... Uh, <laughs> He brings the sable up alongside this just towering mountain, um, so tall that it goes through several layers of clouds. And uh, he brings you up alongside it, and you can see this uh, almost like a road carved into the side of the mountain. And uh, he brings the sable up alongside and drops the speed, so it's essentially hovering there. You still have this, and he holds up the sending stone. Use it this time. Call me when you need a pickup. Holly takes the sending stone and I'd like to clarify that Holly would have pocketed somehow or like wrapped in cloth the shard from the spear you got it keen raw looks at the four of you and says just be careful i patched you up once i don't think i have the supplies to do it again And 
And uh, Christoph would actually reply, <clears throat> not with a joke, and say, it won't happen again. Keenra nods, and though you see a shadow of doubt in his eyes, there's also like a little quirk of a smile in his weird reptilian face. And with his one good eye, he kind of does the like, go on, get out of here. And when he, when he smiles, Kristoff under his breath, almost reflexively would say, you should have that looked at. <laughs> and then he, <laughs> he, he gets on out of there. Uh, probably going over to Sander and just saying, you know, Sandy, this is, this is way outside of, of most of our depths. I think that you're the wisest, classiest one <laughs> when it comes to dealing with others. And so I'm going to really have to lean on you here for your ability to be you <laughs> so that none of us screw it up. Well, <clears throat> We'll have to judge the situation when we get there, but you have gifts. Don't underestimate the, uh, the value of humor, for example, to smooth things over occasionally. Well-placed. But hmm. don't be afraid to be yourself either. And that kind of hits, that kind of pang, because that is something that his brother used to say when his parents would say, well, why can't you be more like your brother? His brother would always later on say, listen, don't listen to them. Why, you know, just don't be afraid to be more like you. And so I kind <clears> of, <throat> thanks Sandy. <clears throat> oh, let's get going. Yeah. I, this doesn't look like being careful, but, uh, Yes. He looks over the edge of the ship. Oh, he's seriously not going to land. Okay. Okay. Well, I thought, you know, we, I thought we were all joking. You know, that's all right. I, I sometimes find humor hard to read, so. <laughs> Me too, turns out. Um, seeing that it's become time to disembark, Holly goes up for one final word with Keenra and says, if Erdogan's stories are true, my dad hated you. But I don't. We'll call you. Keenra is, for the first time in his 2,000 years of life, at a loss for words. Awesome. Uh, to disembark, do you? Do we just make a jump? Yeah, you guys. You guys are. It's it's a it's a little bit of a fall, but it's into snow, and uh, the sable is at least in hovering position, so you're able to leap and land in the snow safely without making a roll. It hurts so bad too. Oh yeah. Uh, every it every injury so is just yeah, just screaming. Yep. <clears throat> but uh you all disembark uh and as you do so, the sable turns to starboard. You hear the hum kick up in the engine and this strange dirigible with a rock holding it aloft disappears into the mist and you're left in the strange insulated silence of snow and that is where we're going to take a quick break uh this feels so awesome to be running provokers again uh, and I was flabbergasted when I looked at the time and saw that we were coming up on an hour and 45 minutes here. So, uh, we're going to take a quick, uh, break here and then come back to finish out the session. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in and hanging out with us. Um, I haven't looked at the 
number of viewers in a bit here, but we're sitting at 48, uh, which is really awesome. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we love that you're here with us. Uh, stick around. We'll be right back. guitar without an amp step dad plays guitar without an amp got kicked out of ross for eating wendy's in the bathroom step dad plays guitar without an amp thank you catch me on spotify i am gonna get one set up real soon
All right, we're back. I got kicked out of Ross for eating Wendy's in the bathroom, but we're back. <laughs> All right, so you are standing on this mountain top. It's cold. You have snow up to your knees, essentially, and there's more coming down. There is a frigid wind that blows up the sides of these mountains. You can see it. It's so cold. It creates this almost waterfall-like effect, this like reverse waterfall of this just chill, frigid air carrying this mist and ice up to you. You feel your eyelashes kind of harden in place. And then you hear a strange call on the wind. This sort of mournful, low, almost groan. It carries its way to you, and it sounds at once both distant and also right around the corner. I've never heard anything like this. Uh, I would kind of immediately go on alert, um, kind of adopt a, a bit of a defensive posture with my uh, with my pole axe. Um, look to the others. Did any of you hear that? You see Holly gripping her crossbow, which is slung around her shoulder at the ready. She just nods. I mean, I know we're supposed to come in peace, but like, do, do we call out? It, maybe. That didn't sound like a dwarf. The call. Yes, let's not be too loud. The call happens again. Closer. Do any of you know what that is? Like, you know, M Mr. Kristoff, maybe you might have heard something like it before. And it, Matt, if that was literal, that we've never heard anything like it in our lives, I would probably then say, you know, no, this is, this is unlike anything. And um, would I be able to tell if it was natural or unnatural? Why don't you give me a nature roll, if you would? Sure. First roll... In the oh, new buddy. Provokers 2020, baby. Here we go. Don't I'll botch it, it, Tim. 20. Don't botch it. I'm eating my, I got my spicy pickle breath. <laughs> I can smell it bouncing off my mic. <laughs> so I can smell it go. from here, baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, someone, who? how do you play 5e? Um, so um, all up, it is a 15. You've never heard this call specifically, but the tonality of it and the way that it carries, it sounds like something is making a call through a horn, like some sort of creature that uses a horn to amplify its call. Okay. And so <clears throat> I would relay that information, but also emphasize that I have no idea what it is but that's what it sounds like. Um, and not knowing what the call means, I would understand uh, that we probably don't want to be spotted by this thing. Holly says, spread out and make sure you have a place to retreat to. Is there any cover, like any maybe sort of like larger rocks or Yeah, uh, there's some... Uh... There are some outcroppings, some little like alcoves, and uh, there's also like a couple of large boulders sort of in the path that you're standing on. Um, so ample cover if you wanted to hide and get out of the way. 
Uh, I'll maybe look for an alcove with kind of like the long lines of sight and then kind of get Holly's attention and kind of point to one of those areas for her. I'm going to beeline it to, uh, to kind of one of the boulders that if judging from where the sound is coming from, I kind of want to be like the first person to get, you know, kind of in that if, uh, if whatever is making that sound kind of comes in our direction. And uh, Christoph would put his hand on Edric's shoulder real quick, at, you know, as we kind of split up. And I would uh, pat you and I'd be like, all right, buddy, we got this. Really what I'm doing is casting guidance on you, which basically means that you get to add a D4 to an ability check because I know we're going to be hiding here maybe. So essentially the way that this works is that you can roll a D4 and add that number to any ability check of your choice. And then the spell ends. So, but it, yeah, so that is now for you, Edric, if we have to use that. And I'll probably need it. Yeah, I figure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Holly's yeah. going to move directly to that alcove that uh, Edric called out. And she's going to take her bag on her hip and she's going to dig it in the snow, scooping up some snow, and she's going to pour it on top of her bow as she rests it on the edge of an alcove to camouflage herself uh, in the snow as best she can. Neat. That's cool. And Sander is going to move to uh, some kind of boulder and I'm going to try to like climb like halfway up. I don't really want to be in the snow, um, but I'm clinging to the a boulder, hopefully not facing whatever, uh, wherever the sound is coming from. You all are able to find ample cover and uh, feel as though you're hidden, at least from sight. And as soon as you do so, you hear footfalls in the snow, and they're muffled, deafened, but you definitely hear something large moving down the path. And it's strange. At first, it sounds like four four limbs one two three four one two three four one two three but then one two three four five six one two three four five six one two three four five six you hear six limbs moving through the snow and coming around the corner you all catch sight of it at the same time uh holly and edric you probably see it a little bit better at first the best way to describe it would be a mingling of ram and rhino. It's this large six-legged creature covered in fur, and it has a single huge horn that juts up from its nose. And as it comes around the corner, you see it using this horn to kind of dig a channel through the snow that it then walks through using this horn almost like a shovel to kind of sweep the snow away. And as it comes into full view, you see there's a dwarf sitting on it. There's a saddle, and there's a dwarf riding it. And the dwarf is kind of moving with this creature. And you see that the dwarf is holding a spear and kind of looking out in all directions. The dwarf is bundled up in furs, and the furs look very similar to this creature it's riding on. Uh, and you can see that beneath the furs, it has this like leather armor. kind of looking in all directions and you hear it go and kind of kick in the sides of this thing and the creature kind of picks up the pace a little bit and it's probably about 30 feet away from you now uh what do you all want to do uh christoph would <clears throat> whisper a strange word in druidic um and you said it's with you said within 30 feet mm-hmm is that correct? Or Yep. Yeah, it's within oh. 30 feet of you. So with that spoken word, you would hear uh, sort of the sound of a... And you would see that this creature is now actually wreathed in um, uh, violet light. It's outlined. So in the, basically, I'm casting fairy fire on the rider and the creature 
And so they're both outlined in violet. So against the snow, they would be extremely visible. Um, now, if both creatures fail a deck save, they're also outlined in, uh, in bright light and actually like shed light in a 10 foot radius. Um, What's the DC? Uh, for me, it's a 12. Okay. I feel like that's a really good way to start a trap that we've all probably done together before Ooh, where Kristoff, yeah. you outline them and then maybe someone goes out and says, you know, freeze. And then everyone else is trained on them or something like that. That's great. I'm into all that. And, and Provokers, this, hands and, up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. They both fail. Okay. So they're now glowing violet. So and this, they, it, I assume they are both, they can both see that they're glowing. So it's funny. It doesn't specify, but I don't know how you'd want to play that. I'd like I, to. I, I would assume would be, that it would be visible unless it specifies that it's not. Uh, yeah, that's fair. So as soon as this happens, as soon as you cast this spell and they both become sort of outlined in this light, the dwarf says something in a language you don't understand. And he kind of like, he goes, huh and pulls up on the reins of this animal. And uh, the dwarf reaches and pulls off the hood, and you see that the dwarf has uh, kind of dusky-looking skin that is lined in these uh, red tattoos that resemble flames. And he's looking in all directions, and he kind of hops off this beast. He says something quietly to the beast, and he holds the spear out. And then he speaks in common. Okay. Whoever is out there, you show yourself. You tread upon the territory of the car of Snarholm. Show yourselves. By this point, would we understand and know who the most charismatic of us is? I, I was going to su suggest this is Edric's cue. Only because you unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> you unmuted. Uh, Nose goes. <laughs> he was just going to. Rookie burn. mistake, Mike. Rookie mistake. Um, Edric, I would probably, uh, uh, at hearing Snarholm, kind of perk up a bit. Uh, I kind of glance around to everyone else and make eye contact and I'm going to kind of go like this regardless of whether or not people are like or you know yeah good idea um, and I'll probably move from around the boulder uh, I would keep uh, as I mean fellow warriors would probably you know definitely be able to see uh, I would definitely keep uh, my pole axe kind of at the rest so, uh, you know, like basically like blade pointed far away and, uh, and kind of just holding it like this. So, hail, um, and, and, uh, well, well met. Um, hello. My name is Edric Meadows. Uh, are you some kind of little giant? Why are you so big? Well, I mean, I don't know, uh. I, mean, I, I grew well. You see, I, I grew up on a farm, and and I mean, I would. I say don't that care. I, what are you doing here? Well, um, I would like to speak to, um, well, your your the, the person in charge. Uh, is, who was that? A king? Is it a the car? A, the car. Car Kyrick. Car Kyrick. You do not have the right to speak to her. Um, trespass on her territory. Well, you see, it, it's really important, and and I've come bearing gifts. Gifts. Presents. What gifts would you have for us? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. Are I, there others? You must all show yourselves. I think Holly would stand up and say and reveal herself she's holding the crossbow at her waist still pointed at the dwarf and she says we'll give the gift to your master mm. 
he kind of looks. You see a little bit of, like, fear flash across his eyes as he realizes that you have this crossbow trained on him. Mm. She, uh, she'll, at that gaze, she'll lower the crossbow and let it hang on the sling. And she'll take the bolt out and hold it in her hand. We... Sandra would pop up under the rock um, ah. that he's clinging to and just kind of give a, a bow, a swooping bow. Uh, how many? Well, Sandra uh, starts counting. <laughs> there's, um, <laughs> well, there's, there's one, uh, two. Oh, and then there's me. Right, that means three. Yep, three. There's three. And that's do, it. Do, yeah. Do we... Unless Kristoff speaks up. I don't want to take that from you, Tim. No, yeah, no I was going <laughs> to. So listen, I was leaning in that direction. And I'm like, oh, do I want to screw us? I don't want to screw us. But then I'm like, ah, but maybe... Do we be, uh, and so I will totally play that game. It's far more interesting to me that I stay hidden, but Give it might. Give me a stealth check us. if you would, Tim. Oh, wow. That's a thing. <clears throat> okay. Did you, did you like my D4? <laughs> Thank you. No. Can I have it back? Can I have it back? So that's a, that is a 14. The dwarf says, three, okay. But then his beast kind of goes. <laughs> no, four. I knew you smelled like fish still, Holly says to Krista. <laughs> As I step out from behind the. Actually, you know what I do? I act like I am just finishing relieving myself. I go, what? Oh, hey, everybody. Oh, goodness gracious. Let me, <laughs> I'm kind of like, uh, you know, patting my shirt down. I'm like, oh, sorry. And I wipe my hands on my shirt. Oh, hey, are these our new friends? Sorry, I was just, uh, <laughs> nature was calling. <laughs> you can deceive these old eyes, but not the snout of the fell horn. It will always smell you out. Ah, yeah, especially with what I was doing. Yep. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to like mark its territory or anything. I just, I, it's really cold and it's hard to go. So I just took advantage of the opportunity. What an odd assortment of people you are. Where do you come from? How did you climb the mountain? Well, um, we came here on a ship. On a ship? Hmm? There is no sea. Uh, a ship. Well? Speak plainly, stranger. I grow see, impatient. No, no, you understand that, but uh, you know we would like to be able to speak to um, the car. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, this would be very important for us to speak to her. I will bring you before the car, but first you must answer this question: Where are you from? Oh, um, well, I mean, I'm from Aldemir. I do not know this place. Well, it's far down south of here. Mm. I am from... <clears throat> I am uh, from the uh, Ravenstorm Highlands. I am This royalty. place I know. Yes. I'm, I'm royalty there. I'm Kristoff Stormraven. Mm. And I am from Sonnegeist. Quite far to the south. Big desert. I know this place. Holly says, 
I hail from Fal... Talmor. Talmor, this place I know. Swamp. Got some nice river bears, too. Mm. Good scenery. Okay. You follow me, I take you into the mountain. But you keep your weapons low. And no more hiding. No more deception. We speak plainly. You are guests now of Snarholm. If you treat me well, I will treat you well. Hmm. Deal. Agreed. I have some dried fish in my bag. Are you hungry? No. It's salted. It's quite good. Mm, no. You follow me now. Okay. No more waste time with talking. He turns and again mounts this creature. I will clear path for you. And the fellhorn begins carving a path in the snow, uh, making it much easier for you all to walk. As you fall in line behind him, he sort of sings under his breath again under a language you don't understand. And occasionally speaks words to his mount and pats it. The fellhorn seems more suspicious of you than the dwarf does. It keeps kind of turning its head and looking at you with these like very intelligent looking eyes and then continuing to carve a path with its horn. Uh, you all have a few moments to speak amongst yourselves uh, if you want to before you arrive in Snarholm. How's the eye? Holly whispers to Kristoff. Uh, and, and I would sort of like blink it. <clears throat> you know, I still, it hurts, especially in the cold, but I can see out of it again. I, uh, h- how's the, you know, and he kind of gestures down toward where, <laughs> you know, how, how's the, 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 you know, how's things? Legs good. Abdomen hurts. Head hurts. Back of my head hurts. Neck hurts. But like you said, the cold, she shivers and shakes it off. Mm -hmm. Someone say anything about a volcano? I might take a swim. (laughs) That would be awesome. I, uh, I still don't know how they live in it. The... Yeah, I'm really curious to see how this goes. Uh, but I'm glad you're, you know, hurt means not dead. So, you too. Holly might nestle up to Sander and make some small talk, but I think it might still be awkward. It's up to you, Nate. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Sanders um, feels something a little off, but um, very tries very hard to make things feel natural. Um, it will be good to get in some warmth. Um, I'm glad that was... It didn't go as poorly as it could have. So this is, this is good. How are, how, how are you feeling, Edric? Well, it's nothing I won't heal in a, in time. My ribs still hurt, but it's a good memory. At least this way, maybe next time I won't fail. I'll be better next time. I mean, that's the only thing I could possibly think I could have done was that maybe I missed something or. I, I didn't hit right or something. No, <laughs> don't think that way. Sometimes we must accept where the wind blows. I guess. I mean, we were fighting a eight foot tall lump of very, very angry metal. So I suppose that it would just make sense that probably wouldn't have come out that one too easy. Exactly. 
I should think when all this is over, and, and maybe uh, with your help I, I can learn my letters a bit better. Maybe I would like to uh, read books. Yes. I would, I would be glad to help you with this. There's a lot of history uh, in the libraries of the Order of the Unscorched. Hmm. Yeah, I would like that. <laughs> be nice. And maybe just... Well, I... I I would like I would like to not f maybe not fight anymore. Hmm. But not yet. <laughs> we still have a job to do, an adventure to do. I don't know. Maybe go back start a farm in Aldemir. I'm sure my folks would parcel me out some land as well as a few neighbors, grow me own crop, raise a few cows be nice you will be a very well-read farmer <laughs> i hope so I'd be the be the smartest farmer that there ever was in aldemir yes the smartest indeed well traveled too so let's uh let's see what this volcano holds eh yeah i'm excited me too uh, and then Nino's I'll... not here. The volcano's to the south. Holly says, right? Wait. I've already forgotten. I was just making a joke. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I'm just following the, uh, what, what, what's it called? Horn? Horn beast? Oh, uh, uh, Fellhorn. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a majestic animal. He is. You should consider writing books when this is done, Edric. <laughs> after you've read them. Well, if I already read them, why would I have to write them? Wait, <laughs> how does reading go? Are you supposed to like read them and then destroy them? And then if you want to give it to someone else, you have to write the whole book out again. Yep, that's how it works. That's how reading works. Well, that seems like a terrible idea. I mean, why don't you just read it and then just pass it on? Strange. Whoa, Wait. Holly feigns a surprised gaze, looks at Kristoff and oh, Sander. Come on. You're, you're only fooling. She laughs and shoves you playfully. Only with make my a, favorite, Edric. My attack favorite roll. captain. <laughs> make an attack roll. Yeah. You, you can, no, no, no. Edric can feel free to like arm bar her freely. There's no, <laughs> no contest. No, no. Natural 20, just, you know, just wind catches Holly him. up and <laughs> throws her off the mountain. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking Holly. I think I'm thinking Holly just kind of shoves him playfully, and he just slips off the mountain, yeah. you know, Charlie Chaplin style. <laughs> uh, as you're kind of finishing up your conversation, the dwarf on the fellhorn turns and says, "Okay, enough foolings. Now we are going into the city. You might have to duck, a little giant." And uh, he kind of gets off the fellhorn and brushes its neck speaks a few words to it in here he points and there's like almost a hidden like alcove around the side of this bend and it's narrow and short but the dwarf kind of turns himself to the side and slips into it and he kind of disappears into the alcove and after a few moments you hear his voice it sounds distant okay come on no daily dally. And I don't. I follow him. No dilly dally. Me too. Um, yeah, I I mean I will dilly, but probably not dally, and then I'll just probably duck uh and then uh, pop in. I'm just sitting here watching Barker unmute and then mute and then go. Like he's thinking about something. Holly has a, a fairly um, 
I mean, obviously, none of us have sheltered lives. We've journeyed already more than the average person in Aranoth. Um, but I think Falhast is the only major city she's ever been in. So what? how does it compare to a place like this once they go in? Without, and again, she does not dilly nor dally. Without dilly nor dally, uh, you all crouch and get in here. And actually, uh, Sander, for you, it's super easy. You just kind of sidle in and you're in the tunnel. Uh, for the rest of you and for Edric uh, particularly, it's a pretty tight squeeze and you actually have to like take off some of your weapons and your pack and kind of toss them through and then sort of suck it in and kind of wedge yourself in. And there's like a terrifying moment, Edric, where you you're stuck and you feel like your armor kind of caught in the rock and you feel this panic kind of rising. And then a strong arm grabs you and the dwarf pulls you through and he goes, we not build tunnel for little giant. You're not fit. Is is there like a front door or a main no. door? No. Why would we build front door that anyone could walk into? This is better. Well, I mean, you you could like post guards on it and mm. make it no. No. That's, right. Okay. No. Fair enough. Fair enough. Just wondered. This way, and he continues down this long tunnel, and. The tunnel is dark. It's narrow. You have to stoop as you're moving through it. Soon the the ice and the snow kind of give way to this slick rock. And then the rock gives way to smooth stone. Almost like it's really odd. It's not carved. It's not mortared. It's it's almost like it was melted and formed this way. And it has the strangest feel as you as you kind of brush against it. It's almost like metal, but it's stone and it has this kind of glassy almost look to it. Almost obsidian. And then you feel this heat, this really intense heat. And it's it's nice at first. But then you start sweating and shedding layers of your snow gear and you see that this dwarf is doing the same he's taking down his hood and taking his furs off and he's down to just this leather armor and then soon you emerge from this tunnel and you see snarholm this cavernous space it is a cave the likes of which you couldn't imagine exist the ceiling is so high that you almost can't see it this place is a glow with this red magma running through it in channels you see gases and smoke rising from it filtering out of these holes in the top of the cavern there are dwarves everywhere. You see them working and toiling, running to and here, run, running to and fro. All of them carrying weapons and shouting at each other in this language. None of them pay you any mind as they go about their business. At the center of this cavern, you see this strange rocky dome, a lava dome, and you can see almost like veins, the lava glowing underneath. And you can see the dwarves down there harvesting this magma. Over this lava dome is a towering statue formed from the rock itself. The statue depicts a dwarf, a woman. She is stout, broad-shouldered. She's wearing armor very similar to the leather armor that this dwarf that you met is wearing. But she wears a helmet with a fell horn cresting it, coming out the top. And she's holding out her right hand, which is wreathed in this massive gauntlet. And out of the gauntlet, through her fingers, 
rivers of lava flow into the channels below. And as you see, take all this in, the dwarf looks up to this statue and does a kind of salute where he holds up his fist, kind of like she is doing, and he speaks a word you've never heard before. Two words, actually. Gardrakna. He turns to all of you. This is our home. It's quite something. Beautiful. It, it's... Yeah, it's really amazing. Um, Sorry, so really quick question. Uh, when is the 3D isometric map of this place coming? Because <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. I'm 7,000% in. I'm yeah, dinosaur gotta... lasagna in. Let me email John Pintar right now. Actually, yeah, while we're that'd be about. that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I tweeted at him about uh, two minutes ago, so we're oh, good. Okay, perfect, great. <laughs> Let's get him on the horn. Get him on the fell horn. Ah. Uh, 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 we're I, gonna I, need a lot more horns. <laughs> as uh, as this dwarf, who's we didn't really even introduce ourselves proper. He didn't really mention his name, or he did, and uh, it went in one ear and out the other. Um, pretty sure he didn't. But as the dwarf looks at me, um, and I kind of look at the dwarf, kind of think, stop, and like, kind of raise a fist as well as like mimicking, basically aping him as he did. Um, Card Durakna. Mm. No. No? No, we are not the subject of Snarholm. You do not pay tribute to the first queen. Oh, okay, sorry. I, I just, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to do that. It's, it's like a common thing, you know? Mm, no. Being, trying to be polite, you know, like if that, you know. But okay, oh, okay, okay. So, sorry. So, sorry. Um, you have gifts. I will take you to the car. She will judge them. If if she doesn't like the gifts, is it is it is there like a, you'll have to leave now, or is that you will ha your body will have to leave, but your head kind of goes somewhere else, like like mm. no, um, you will get tossed into the hearth, and he points to the lava dome. Right. Well. Okay. I was it's wrong about death. the volcano. Without looking, but saying it, just saying, no kidding. Yep. Well, um, let's uh, let's hope she's in a good mood. Sander, following Edric, um, is like taking the corner of his sleeve and just kind of like polishing the um, the axe. The what is it? Troll. The, the troll, troll cutter. cutter troll cutter there we go thank you and uh just trying to you know brush it off a little bit and make it, make it shine a little bit <laughs> um if the dwarf looks back rather nonchalantly by all means this dwarf turns and begins walking down the uh the path and he says kind of almost to himself better be good gifts did he say gifts Oh, yeah, I, I, I said gifts. Okay. We'll come up with something, I'm sure. Well, no, I, I have I have bronze eye spear on my pack. Right? That's yes. fancy. I mean, it's a bit broken, but I'm sure it'll be fine. It'll be we'll fine. Hold on to that. I, I'm almost positive that we're going to give her the axe. Like, oh, yeah. But do I that, start with the axe or or maybe something else? I think let's just make it the axe only. Right? Just and, lead with the... Okay. Yeah, and that's a pretty big one. Priceless, remember? Right, but... Invaluable. Oh, yeah. that I, is the value we were looking for. Right? I mean, some might even say it's worthless. 
Yeah, some might say that. You said that. That's it's exactly okay, everybody. Right. Edric oh. said gifts, and if it turns out that we need gifts, she looks at Edric. You're pretty useful. <laughs> Wait. Mm -hmm. Nothing. What? Nothing. He's joking, but um, but don't say worthless though. Okay. Well, that's what. We'll oh. work on that when we work on the, the writing and reading thing. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and just be careful of what you add asses to the end of, especially when they're priceless. <laughs> priceless has two S's, and that's okay. That's a good one to say. <laughs> <laughs> this has now become an educational D&D &D stream. Is, uh, <laughs> Bring I'm your sorry. kids. It's, it's much easier if I can write it down, and the it's hard to write while I'm is walking. The priceless. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, this dwarf leads you all through the city of Snarholm and uh, as he does so you do start to attract some some curious looks from all of these dwarves uh, all of them have the same kind of uh, like dusky skin uh, and most of them have uh, tattoos mimicking flames or uh, rivers of lava and you can see that uh, as you kind of inspect these tattoos and look closer at the ones on uh the dwarf that you met um that the tattoos are actually elaborate they have runes and diagrams within them and so within the flames and within these like rivers of lava there are like stories being told of uh things that these dwarves have done things that they've accomplished uh some of them have like anvils and hammers some of them have weapons um there's lots of different sort of things happening here. And each one has unique tattoos. Um, this dwarf leads you through a workshop area. Um, you can see that it looks like most of the dwarves in here live in these, they're almost like these uh, stalagmite, stalactite sort of things where they sort of meet in the middle. They come down from the ceiling and come up from the floor. And you can see windows and lights shining in these formations where the dwarves all live. Um, you enter into what looks like a makeshift hospital of sorts. There are dozens of dwarves in here uh, bandaged up and bleeding, and there are clerics kind of moving through, uh, helping all of them. Uh, there's definitely a war going on here. That is of no doubt. Dwarves are either forging weapons, carrying weapons, or recuperating from being struck with weapons. Uh, and as you enter the, into the hospital, this dwarf says, Wait here. I will get the car. I'm Ilda, by the way. Nice to meet you, Ilda. Mm, no. No? Hmm. I will get the car. He moves off to go find her. There's a few moments where you're all kind of standing there awkwardly, sort of looking around. You see a uh, dwarf. He's laying on this mat, and he's uh, groaning in pain, and you see that his he's missing an arm, and it's been sort of hacked off, and it's bleeding. And this cleric comes up, speaks a few words to him, and then you, you hear the cleric say, Kardurakna. And the dwarf says, Kardurakna. And the cleric fuses this wound shut with their molten hot piece of metal. And the dwarf just grits his teeth as this is happening. And then kind of lapses into unconsciousness. The cleric kind of pats him and moves on to the next person. And as you're kind of watching all of this unfold, another dwarf approaches. She is uh, wearing the same armor that all of these dwarves are wearing. But you see on her right hand, she carries this gauntlet. And you recognize it, the same gauntlet that was depicted in that statue. The gauntlet looks as though it's made of stone, though it has interlocking pieces just like a metal gauntlet would and you can see that running through this gauntlet almost like a channel is 
magma. It's glowing red. She approaches, looks all of it, looks at all of you curiously, and says, I am Kar Kyrick, the leader of this place. Who are you and why are you here? I think without realizing that he started to talk, Kristoff, who in that moment looks much like his father, uh, actually speaks clearly, plainly, without sarcasm, and says, We are a group known as the Provokers. We come to treat with you with honor and respect, and we bear gifts. And then he realizes a gift. The Provokers, this is not a name that I am familiar with. Understood. Uh, we are we are lowly, and it is not surprising that someone of your status wouldn't know of us. So we thank you for your time, and we wish to present you with a gift fitting of your station. Let us have it, then. Oh, oh, oh. That's me. Uh, and then I'll take off the pack and kind of hold like grab the 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 axe and kind of like kind of hold it out and kind of like maybe like a like a partial bow or something but very awkwardly like i have no idea what i'm doing but she looks at this weapon Karduragna. This is a troll cutter. But its flame has gone out. She reaches for it. A mighty gift. Is this indeed what you intend to bestow upon me? It is. For someone as powerful as you, a weapon that only begins to match your own ferocity and flame. These were forged here in this mountain, in the hearth. Now it returns home. She takes it with a reverence that you might not expect. And as the gauntlet kind of closes around the haft of this thing, she closes her eyes. This is stone of my mountain. Where did you come by such a weapon? And it, it, it kind of funny, like Kristoff sort of wouldn't be able to recall in the moment exactly like, wait, where did we get this? And there was the spear and there's like, you know, as Holly said, it has felt like a year has happened uh, in, in the span of a week in that ship. And so I'm trying to remember exactly what the details were. And so I, I shoot a glance at Sander like, hey, I can't remember the exact details of which one of these things we got from where and from who and who's a provoker. Like, this weapon was actually wielded by a great hero from far south of here um presumably found by him somewhere or acquired somewhere on his adventures and uh, it was bestowed upon us um, and we return it to his home his name was Braswick Feeblehammer. 
he was a dwarf, a cleric, and uh, his deeds are legendary. Legends of his deeds have not reached this far north, but truly he must have been a hero to wield such a weapon. This is a weapon that has been lost to us for many ages. Now it has come home. I'm in your debt. Please tell me your names. I am Sander Danara. I hail from the deserts of Sonnegeist. My name is Edric Meadows. Uh, I am from Aldemir. Holly Ellington, Talmor. Christoph Stormraven, right tackle. No, I just... <laughs> the University of Missouri. <laughs> Alabama State Penitentiary. Uh, I Ohio would have... State. <laughs> no, no, I started it. That's not anything to be sorry about. Um... Army surplus store. <laughs> <laughs> Ella wishes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would say Kristoff uh, Storm Raven from the Raven Storm Highlands. Uh, the Storm Ravens send their regards and their best. Oh, you were about to kill her. It's like Storm Raven, send their regards. <laughs> like, oh my God. Whoa, whoa. Regards. <laughs> regards. I send my regards. Uh, regards. <laughs> we have to uh, stop laughing about that right now, or we're going to have to explain it. Let's keep going. Gotta, we got we to move on. We got to move on. Um, so far, you have traveled to come here. And you've brought this gift. You can't have come to Snarholm just to visit. Why are you here? Why have you come? We would like to uh, enter with your permission, Carr, um, the Vault of Eris. What purpose do you have with the Vault of Eris? And and I I'll look to Mister I'll look to Sander. Um, well, there is an object that we um, received word may be there that we are most deeply afraid of falling into the wrong hands. It's a very small object. In exchange for this gift, I would gladly grant you entrance into the vault but unfortunately it has been taken from us we no longer control the vault it belongs to Svelberg as she says that every dwarf with an earshot spits <laughs> they're just spit everywhere If so you... the enemy of my enemy is 
my friend. These are now our enemies. Svelbrick is the enemy of everyone. The enemy of Ernoth. They follow a profane god and seek to enslave all they deem lesser, which is everybody. If you wish to enter the vault, you must take it from Svelbrig. And I would look, I would look back at Holly because I don't know much about her past, but I know she has a military background and I know she has the most experience with this kind of thing. And so far it's been diplomacy and giving gifts and presenting things and talking about lore and all this stuff. But now we're talking about military operation. And so I would kind of look to Holly and with my eyes, just say like, is that, can we do, is this doable? Do you think we can do this? Holly shrugs, kind of looks around Everyone's spitting. Um, I think we'd rather not. Yeah. Um, yes, we... <clears throat> Let's do it. And that was both to the car and to Matt. <laughs> Perfect. Great. <clears throat> okay. The vault. Ilda can lead you to it. From there, you will be on your own. We must manage the fight on the span. The bridge connecting our two kingdoms. The vault will be heavily defended, but also they won't be expecting an attack. If you can strike quickly and quietly, you might just catch them off guard. The Duergar, they are crafty. They fight without mercy. They carry strange weapons. You must approach with caution, but also be swift and sure in your strikes. If you are truly prepared to do this, Snarholm will be in your debt, both for returning this weapon to us and for securing the vault again in our name. In exchange, you may enter the vault. She kind of looks around a little bit. You may take what you need from it. Is the weapon alone not worth that? Do we have to thrust ourselves into another war against people that have never wronged us? Without this... You cannot enter the vault. And if you try to do so, you will face their wrath one way or the other. Okay. Here we go again. Holly looks jaded as she puts the crossbow bolt back from her hand into the into the into the weapon the fight is always somewhere she says Kardurakna and every dwarf with an earshot Kardurakna <laughs> if you are truly prepared to do this Ilda will take you I wish you luck. And if today is to be the day you die, 
Captain. It was nice to meet you. A dwarf runs up to her, whispers in her ear. I must go see to the battle on the bridge. Good luck. She turns and marches off, and you see Ilda standing there. All right. You go to vault now? I think we are ready. Okay. You follow. Again, Ilda leads you through Snarholm and sort of up the opposite wall of this massive cavern. Another tunnel. You move through it, crouched, and then find yourselves again outside as Ilda puts his hood up and puts his furs on. You find yourselves doing the same. And uh, he kind of points. And you see through the fog, through the mist, through the snow that is blowing, a stone structure kind of carved into the mountain itself. There. That is vault. Right. Well, uh, how, how how do we how do we get in? There is a bridge, not too far from here, it leads to the gate. The vault has a big front door. Stupid dwarves did not build. I mean, not having to crouch is okay. Mm, no. Uh, right, well, um, if this is where we part ways... Any best... uh, words of wisdom for us, Ilda? Advice? Mm. God, I've never faced... Kal Drakna? Mm. No, Kar no. Drakna. Oh, right, Kar... Drachna. Hmm. No. You stop trying. Well, all right then. Right. Well, Ilda. Be safe. Fight with honor. Mr. Sander, can you say the thing for me? Because apparently I don't do it right. No, I can't. Okay, just ch just checking. Mm -hmm. All right. Just, well, um, goodbye. Many thanks, Ilda. I Ilda. Mm. I forgot her name. His name too. I can't. I can't say any of these things right. As you, as you are turning to go, he says, mm. "Kadrakna is phrase." means even stone melts. Oh, it, it means, of course it means something. Encouraging. Hmm. Hmm. And Sander gives kind of like a, mm. like he's trying to send a little very wise words. Hmm. <laughs> no, Holly does the same. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> Mm. It's it's like how accents mm. kind of rub off, like the, mm. the <clears throat> has rubbed off a little bit. <laughs> mm. He says in response. Holly wonders quietly what hmm means. <laughs> <laughs> With that, he turns and disappears into the alcove back into Snarholm. Well, let's check it out. Right. Well, um, 
I'll take point. Seems of um hopefully I can just maybe just shove things <laughs> shove things off the cliff and whatnot. All right, guys, so I shared a link in the uh, chat. We'll see if this works. Uh, tonight, we are using a new virtual tabletop. Uh, it's still in beta, but it's really promising. Uh, it's called Albear Rodeo. And it's a really simple, slick little VTT that I'm really enjoying playing around with. <clears throat> it uh has kind of the like ease of use as uh using <laughs> Google Slides like we have been using, but it has a lot of the cool tools that Roll20 has as well. So uh I'm assuming that deer, giant wasp, and giant hyena are you guys. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm giant wasp. I'm, I'm giant poisonous <laughs> snake. Oh my I'm, god. I'm giant hyena. Who the hell is deer? I <laughs> I don't know. You should be able to change Tim your name. Tim got deer. You click the little deer. pencil in the bottom left, and you can change yeah. your name. Okay, cool. And if it looks all blank, you're seeing the right thing, guys. Yeah, I was wondering that, and then I was like, nah, it's probably because he's got it hidden. Oh, wait, what's blank? I think you have Fog of War on. <gasps> Ta-da! Which is cool. Um... Huh. Oh, remove fog. There we go. Can you guys see it now? Not yet, but I'm sure I will in a I second. I see a blue screen. Yeah, like a bluishy gray kind of. Ah, how screen. interesting. Maybe Toggle it's secret fog. to us. Remove fog. Foggle tog. Hmm. Schmog and rog. It's, it's probably because I'm screwing around making it giant holly. Instead of just Holly. Holly smash. Giant Holly. Can you guys oh. see the can you see the tokens? No. 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 Can't see wow. anything. I mean we can see everything on your screen, but we won't be able to move our deals. Yeah. Okay. Um That is really strange. I wonder if uh if there's a way for me to uh Is there a hide uh, image setting or something that's beyond fog of war. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Okay, fog tool. You guys see uh, the dice tray that oh, I have on there? Did that do it? No. Nope. Damn it. Not, not yet. Let me refresh. Disable pro fog preview. Friggin' beta. No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do see a dice tray, but it's mine. Move. Yeah, I just yeah. wondered if you could oh, okay. see that I, I rolled 50 Weird, I'm 20s. clicking remove fog, but it's not. Fog brush. Okay, that's... <laughs> <laughs> what the hell's going on? Something's funky. Something is funky. Um, If we have to just a... go off your screen, that's fine too, Matt. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's... We'll, we'll do that. Do me one favor, though, and refresh in case it. you have to refresh after I turn off the... Oh, sure remove fog just to see if it works and if not you guys can just look on my screen and then i'll be fine mm -hmm. there's also a cache clearing clear cache hmm. on the settings in the settings gear okay cool nope mm -mm. yeah how, still the same how very Bummer. strange what first thing tomorrow we're gonna mess with this <laughs> allow others to edit oh allow others to edit fog Albert Rodeo not loading for players. Um, when you create the map, there's an arrow to expand the options list. There are there are an option to allow access to tokens, fog, or drawings. If you do this, they will have to import their own tokens. Hold on. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Fresh well, we'll just go off my screen for now. And uh, oh, um, what you looking at? Josh said sometimes closing the tab and reopening worked. So instead of it, oh, instead of refreshing, instead of refreshing, 
Yeah, like fully, I'll try that. Fully reloading. You. Okay, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Didn't work. All right. It did not work for me either. <clears throat> no problem. We'll Thank just go you, off my screen and we'll get it figured out before the next sesh. So this is a good test of this uh, VTT. So cool. uh, approaching the vault, you see this stone structure built into the mountain. It has this large door and you see a number of creatures congregating outside. And I, I put your tokens here, but this isn't actually how close you are. You're still approaching from, from pretty far away, about 60 feet away. Um, you see these figures that are um, dwarf in size and stature. Uh, they're broad. But as you get closer, you see that they are wearing this white armor, scale armor that is like bright white. And their skin is this icy blue color. All of them are carrying these weapons that seem to emanate cold. There's like this cold just kind of washing off of these weapons. There are four of these creatures standing near the door, plus a fifth one who is wearing uh, a helmet that is pretty resplendent has like these um almost like spines going along the back of it and at the edge of this ravine here on the other side of the bridge you see a sixth uh duergar that is standing with a creature that looks somewhat familiar to all of you it's clearly a drake which you have faced before in falhast but this one has ice white scales uh, clearly a drake that is more uh, suited to this cold environment. Um, the Duergar are speaking to one another in a language uh, that some of you might understand. Does anyone speak draconic? Okay. No, sir. Well, they're not speaking draconic. I just asked that uh, just to get a gauge just to feel get a feel of the room <laughs> mm -hmm. they don't seem to have noticed you and for the most part they seem fixated on the door however this duergar here with the drake is clearly supposed to be a lookout um as he's kind of like scanning and that he has the drake kind of not on a leash but is sort of like uh up next to the drake sort of managing the creature and it's sort of like sniffing the air how do y'all want to proceed And from which area are we entering in? Over here, off to the okay, so that's, to this okay. left mm -hmm. side. Yeah. There is quite a bit of tree coverage leading up to the bridge, as well as uh, some sort of like drifts in the snow where the wind has kind of piled the snow up. And there's some rocks as well. Hmm. Well, I wonder if we should... I'm assuming that beast over there has better senses than the rest. I wonder if we try to draw its attention first and um, take advantage of a little time with it before the rest might notice. Or perhaps it is quite close to the edge. <laughs> I don't know if there's a way to... A spell, perhaps, or I don't know. Is the does the ground underneath the Drake look like it might be susceptible if there's some sort of explosion to collapse and the Drake fall into the cavern? It definitely looks like pieces of that edge have fallen before. Uh, the stone is definitely unmaintained, uh, and so you could definitely see like if enough force was delivered. Uh, you could potentially collapse portions of the the edge into that ravine. Holly looks to Sander and nods, and you see it just the subtlest of orange light emanate from the bolt, the tip of the crossbow bolt, and you also see it slightly in her eyes. And she walks. She's going to move, uh, I mean, looking at the map, um, to a vantage point, probably across actually the opposite side of the drake. 
to stay hidden from the Drake. Um, Over here. Yep, up there, a vantage point where she could shoot the ground underneath the Drake. Ooh, look, I can move you guys off the map if you're not there yet. That's beautiful. Okay, Dope. cool. Uh, Holly, why don't you give me a stealth check if you would, please? Okay. I am going to use my inspiration mm -hmm. to do that one more time, rolling on the Ellington Estate Dice Tower. Brought to you by Many Terrain Domain. Sponsored okay. by Rockstar Energy. <laughs> Main stage. I'm a I'm a I'm definitely a rock star guy. Hold up. That is a, a 15 and my stealth is four, so that's 19. Okay. And I don't have inspiration. What does it that look like as Holly two. slinks through these trees that are little more than frozen shrubs uh, and remains hidden as she does so? She moves like a mirage. She passes, you see her pass behind a tree. And then as she emerges from the other side, the backdrop of uh, this, this area outside the vault changes to the Dusk District. And she's moving behind a pillar, uh, maybe creeping up on some sort of um, gang raid. And then she moves behind another pillar. And then again, it transforms into a tree. And she's back here, um, channeling all of her skills from the, oh crap, that's really far away. Uh, tr channeling all of her. I, I'm sorry. I love that you can do measurement. I love that you have a measuring stick. That's the yeah. coolest freaking thing it's ever. Pretty Are you dope. Me? Pretty dope. Okay, so actually, that is pretty good range. Um, but she's channeling her job in Falhast, and uh, she she changes her mind halfway through. And she closes her eyes and she aims at the drake and the, and the ground beneath the drake. And she pretends she's back at home in Talmor. A child practicing her aim with her mom's crossbow. Did you roll? Oh, I didn't realize we were attacking. I thought everyone else was going to position themselves. I oh, I thought you were going to shoot first. No, go for oh, it. Oh, no. Shoot? I should shoot? No, okay. no, no. Oh, Don't listen to me. He goes, Don't, listen Don't to do me. it. Don't do it. It's Don't a bad shoot. idea. Hold on. You're saying, do it. Don't do it. Do it. Don't do it. I feel like this is last session all over again. <laughs> Aridon emerges from the trees. <laughs> Holly, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you? Whoa, oh, shit. I thought hey. you dropped you off Aridon's in another country, dude. Aerodon's like a golf announcer. Yeah. All right. Looks like she's teeing up here. Hey, Holly. Uh, what are you doing? <laughs> Got a she's simple Drake <laughs> going for the four iron. Understood. Oh, looks no like she's, in position. Uh, she's got going. one of her arcane archer abilities lined up here. So we're going to see how this goes for her. Spoilers, bro. <laughs> um, Bo spoilers, bro. So, so Holly is in position. What does everyone else want to do? Um, I would say that further down. So I move further down uh north so that i'm you know uh away from the prying eyes of the creatures on the bridge mm -hmm. and so i'm i sort of i take a deep breath a couple deep breaths and then at a full run i jump off the cliff <gasps> <laughs> that was real i love it <laughs> and um you would potentially hear some sort of cracking and breaking and some uh different crunches and 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 pieces and then you'd see this majestic snow owl uh emerge and so now I am a, I have wild shaped into a giant owl 
and I am now flying above and I would land probably on a branch near Holly. Uh, and this is the, this is the first time that Kristoff's wild shape has actually taken a druidic animal form and not the strange twisted sort of like wooden armored look. And so uh, you did I did that be... last session. I did. Owl Toff. Owl Toff and Wolf Toff. Oh, that's right. Remember I, I, Chris Pine? Someone said Lupine plus. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. I do remember. I've been waiting so long to make an Owl Toff joke this whole game. And you just, I was like, don't take this from me. <laughs> so I am now a, a, a giant owl. And my attempt, Matt, to do the, the, the reason why I did a, like a white snow owl is so that I would look at least reasonably indigenous. Yeah. No, that's great. Uh, so like the the Duergar and the the frost drake like they kind of like look over and notice like the owl flying but they're just like oh it's an owl and they don't they don't act upon it at all awesome uh sander edric what are you two doing to get into position here i'm just gonna sneak up to the tree line a little bit and just kind of chill there crouched okay Go ahead and give me a stealth check, if you would, please, Sander. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tim, do you like that I changed your icon to a little, little wing? I almost interrupted the game to say how excited I was at how fast you did that. I yeah. was like, and it's even like a snow owl, like white. Like, oh, I yeah. love it, Matt. I, I know you guys can't see the tokens, but it's so nice it's like a little toolbar with all these awesome tokens and you just scroll through the tokens and you can drag and drop them is it really on the great. right of the of the screen it is because yeah. that's all i could see that's all we can yep. see oh okay cool Dope. Yeah. so you guys are familiar with it then <laughs> <laughs> i used my inspiration and i got an 11 oh the frost drake <laughs> kind of starts moving through the snow towards you, Sander. The Duergar kind of managing it, kind of curses at it in this language, but then kind of pays attention, starts following the drake. It begins moving in this direction with the Duergar behind it. It has smelled you. It smells juicy halfling. Getting ready to shoot was not a uh, ready to action, was it? It can be. B -b 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 Bummer. I would. So here's the thing. I would say that if you're sitting there and you're sighting down this crossbow and you're like, got the Drake in my sights, and then if the Drake starts moving towards you, like, yeah, you can shoot. And specifically, the Drake moving away from that spot that is yeah. especially close to the edge. Yeah. Uh, yep. I think I think she'd release an arrow, uh, a bolt. She. Um, yeah. She is aiming at an apple that she climbed to the chagrin of her mom to the top of the house to place on top of the chimney. And she's sighting it in as a, as a young child. And she closes her eyes and opens them and fires at the drake. Yeah, boy. Total 24. That hits. It's been a long time. <laughs> she sees the, uh, the top of the chimney burst alongside the apple as she uh, hears the sound of the shattering ceramics of the, sh of the shattering stone. And she gets terrified for a moment. Uh, and her dad comes out looking looking up at the chimney and looking for her. Uh, she did use a bursting arrow, uh, force energy, drawn from the school of evocation. The energy detonates after the attack. Um, so the first of all, the arrow would hit the creature, but I specifically was aiming at the feet of the creature. So it wouldn't mm -hmm. actually hit the creature. So it wouldn't do that damage. Um, but the energy detonates the target that ground and all other creatures within 10 feet take 2d6 force damage each which i'm going to roll right now go for it 
No. <laughs> <laughs> where, did you, where did you go? Where did you go? My D6. Boo, do, do, do. I right here the whole time. Okay. Oh, that's fell off. Okay. Nine. Nine damage. Okay. So that's on the Drake as well as the Duergar Handler. Uh, what I'm going to do is, as the ground beneath the drake kind of gives way, I'm going to have the drake make a dexterity saving throw to try and stay on the cliffside. Um, so let's do it this way. Uh, do your arcane arrows have uh, spell saves attached to them? They do not. Not the bursting arrow. Do any of the other ones? Uh, maybe the... Hold on. Here, let's do it this way. Uh, so we'll do eight plus your proficiency modifier plus your, uh, whatever your attack bonus, I guess. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, 16. 16. Okay, cool. So the total attack bonus is six. Okay, cool. Okay. It does not make the save. Uh, the arrow, well, you describe it, Barker, because this thing is going over into the ravine. So go ahead and describe how what that looks like. The earth shatters underneath it. A part of the bridge actually goes first, collapsing in. Mm. Underneath the drake, the ground just melts like stone. Kardurakna, Holly thinks. As the drake slides in, grasping, clawing, scraping its its claws against the stone, but to no avail. And you hear it let out this. I'll let you do the sound, Matt, because <laughs> I would do a Wilhelm scream. I mean, that's what I was going to do, too. So okay. you go for it. It's and it you, just buddy. falls into the falls into the abyss beneath. Awesome. And uh, I went ahead and made this Duragar make the save. He actually made the save, so he is prone, but he manages to kind of like scramble up back onto the cliff so he doesn't fall. Uh, he kind of looks and sees the drake disappear into the mist uh, beneath. Awesome. Cool. Okay, so uh, before we roll initiative, uh, Edric... All of this is happening simultaneously. Where do you want to be before we roll initiative? I mean, fuck at home in Aldermir. <laughs> <laughs> what if that weren't an but, option? <laughs> ah, um, then yeah, I would probably, I would probably follow Sander uh, okay, cool. uh, into Sander. the tree line. Yeah, and I'd probably like be like closer to the bridge, so in case anyone kind of tries to come up. Uh, I I'd be the first one to to get him. Okay, know. great, cool, cool, cool. All right, let's go ahead and roll initiative. Can I use that D four that I got on initiative? Is that even the thing that could um, possibly happen? I always wondered. So I was gonna say it's up. To, oh no, you're the DM. I'll shut up. So initiative is not technically an ability check or skill check. So I would say no. Cool. That's what I was going to say. I can use that for an attack later. Cool. Right? Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, who wants to be my initiative buddy? I'll be your initiative buddy. Yes. Okay. So, uh, initiative for bad guys is 18. Dern. Okay. So, Barker. Baddies. Hold on. What did you get, Edric? 14. Okay. Barker, Baddies, Edric, Kristoff, and finally Sander. Okay. So that means, Holly, mm. you are up first. Holly grasps another bolt, and she pulls it out of her quiver, and she's surrounded by grass. And the, the humid humidity of Talmor is hanging on the air. She places it in the crossbow and immediately takes aim at the apple perched above the fence post. It's like a stone fence, a stone wall, but a post at the entrance of Ellington Estate. And she hears a voice in her head. Holly, no. And she fires at the apple anyway. But 
as she was distracted in her younger life, she feels a little distracted now, but she's aiming and she fires and she gets a 24. Whoa. She, she, uh, she fires and it hits the stone of the wall and the apple, it, she actually missed the apple, but it falls off tumbling and she thinks that counts. And uh, so, but she does do her usual damage, D10. Which uh, which of these guys are you shooting at? Um, she would actually shoot at the one that's trying to climb back up. This guy here. Yeah. Down here. Is that okay? Yeah, this guy here. Or was that person already targeted? Okay. Nope, yep. you go for it. I see. Um, this is an apple she's shooting at. This is not a person. Mm -hmm. And she won't let her believe otherwise. Um, I always forget this, and it's been a long time since we've played. Do I add my dex bonus to the damage? Yes, you do. 13. Wow, okay. Uh, what does it look like as you kill this guy? It looks like a crossbow bolt through an apple as she shoots it after it toppled on the ground. Um, that's what Holly sees. This dwarf is just pinned to the ground by this bolt, and he struggles for a second and then goes limp as the snow around him reddens. Anything else on your turn? Any movement, Holly? Holly is going to see the actions of the other enemies on the bridge and yell, Be ready! as they begin to take their turn. Yes, and they do indeed. All right. The Duergar move quickly. Uh, they are clearly trained for this. The Duergar with the helmet uh, barks orders in this language as the three armored Duergar around him take up defensive positions at the midpoint of this bridge standing in tight formation uh, while this one in the back prepares this odd looking weapon all right we're gonna get i think edric sander and holly are gonna get attacks at them these guys in range Ooh. Yep. No, actually, Holly is not in range. Not of movement, but my crossbow is 100. Slash no, no, no. I know before. that. I mean, for oh. these guys. Oh. Nope. There we go. All right. Attacks coming at Sander and Edric. Here we go. These... Duergar take out these uh these weapons that almost look like um they almost look like clubs but in the head of the club there's like this scoop and inside each of these indentations in the club there is what looks like a a jagged icicle um almost in the shape of like a throwing dart and each of these Duergar sort of wheel back with these weapons and they swing as if they would be swinging a club, but at the midpoint of this swing, these icicles come hurling out of these weapons. Um, and I don't know if you, if anyone would be familiar with these weapons, but they're known as atolatls. I've used an atolatl. Have you? Yep. There's, we have an atolatl guy in my area. That, I'm not kidding. Of I'm not course kidding. you have an atolatl guy. I'm not kidding is what I'm I just said. When you say atolatl, everything becomes yeah. an atolatl. Uh, Barker's like, I've used an atolatl. I defended my property with it. It's my primary means of defense. Yes. Uh, so this is attack number one coming at Sander is a miss. Attack number two coming at Edric is a miss. Attack number three coming at Edric is a crit. That's a nat 20. Uh, so that's going to be... Uh, 
Okay, so this is going to be 10 piercing damage plus 8 cold damage, Edric. And I'm going to need you to give me a constitution saving throw. Well, all right then. Uh, maybe I'll go ahead and use inspiration on that. By the way, <laughs> by if you the want to way. see the stat blocks of these bad guys, go to patreon.com slash mattclick, where I'll be posting these stat blocks and more from tonight's session tomorrow. Oh, my, oh my God. <laughs> oh. Okay, yeah. Uh, definitely made it. That was a nat 20. Okay. So, still take a bunch of damage, and you feel... As this icicle punctures your armor, Edric, and you feel it slide into your flesh, you feel this intense supernatural cold begin to spread from it, uh, but your body manages to sort of fight it off, and you see the icicle begin to melt uh, in the wound uh, as you stave off the magic. Uh, these other two Duergar are standing back, holding melee weapons, uh, preparing themselves for any sort of onslaught. Uh, the guy with the helmet is continuing to bark orders uh, in this strange language. All right, who's next up in initiative? I believe Edric. it's me. Yep. Edric. <laughs> All right. Uh, can I reach the Duergar from here? You can, because their range on their weapons is your movement speed. <laughs> Convenient. So you're going to charge up here across the bridge to these guys? I will, yeah. Um, I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'll go in and, and... just like that. Okay, e cool. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they go dizzy and fall and... down. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, I'll do that. And uh... Imagine you charging it's... across this bridge is so cool, by the way. Yeah, through the snow, like, and it's Edric, like, in his winter skin, where it's, like, fur and stuff around his armor, and he's, like, charging across this bridge with his pole arm. Yep, the, uh, you can see charging through a single snowflake is cut in half by the sharpness of the pole axe. <laughs> Just, yep. It just comes up straight down yes. and uh, attacks. Uh, oh my god! Brings down the first Duragar, and that is a. Oh, what is it to hit for me? <laughs> that is a like plus eighteen. Eighteen? No, <laughs> no, it was plus six. But uh, I do, I did get an eighteen. As I'm running, as I'm running, uh, I'm not sure if it's a, if it's a bonus action, or if it's a full action to uh turn switch on my shield of shielding i believe that is a bonus action cool uh, yeah also cutting through the shield just activates and begins to kind of spin in direction so my ac is now 19 oh my god perfect great uh <laughs> yeah awesome cool so yeah so uh that was so i had an 18 to hit the durigar yeah, that hits. Okay, and... Uh, Let's call him Doo Doo. Doo Doo the Doo Regard. Mm, yes, indeed. Uh, and doo -doo. <clears throat> okay, so cool. it'll be... So I'm going to use a... Uh... Now, could it be the Duragar that hit me with that thing? Whatever yeah, that thing absolutely was? I can. And he's like, he's reloading Man, it as you're running up, and he has this like look of sheer terror on his face as he realizes how big... And how heavily armored you are. So I'm going to use a. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, use one of my... Parker. Oh. <laughs> I'm you looked a lot my... smaller from far away. <laughs> so I'm going to use my Battlemaster uh, disarming attack. Uh, so mm. I'm going to expend one of my superiority dice. So drop that down to three. Plop, plop. Uh, and yeah, so I'm going to. Yeah, get to add a superiority die to damage, which is good. So we got uh, 13, 4 is 17. So that's uh, 17 points of slashing damage. And uh, the Durgar has to make a strength save. Uh, it has to beat a, you have to beat a 14. Nope. Uh, so the, so you, the weapon is dropped. So 
the weapon just goes flying into the ravine, uh, this atolatl that he's carrying. Um, and he kind of looks on in terror and then is reaching for this blade at his hip uh, to draw out. All right, anything um, else in your turn, Ed? Well, I'm actually, I've got to double check. I can't remember if I have, no, fifth level is when I get the extra attack. Uh, so... Uh, well, thank God for that. <laughs> you do have your yeah. action surge, however. I do, yeah. Yeah. Smoke them if you got them, Mike. Okay. Okay, you talked me into it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this guy's so... over here banking inspiration like health potions in a Final Fantasy <laughs> game. <laughs> yeah, right. like, I'm pretty sure the Valdiveris part two is gonna be. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure this part is part one. one. Boy, I'm pretty sure we're not resting. So, uh, so my next was to hit was a 17 to hit. Uh huh. Yep. Okay. I think that actually uh, just hits. Oh, uh, nice. Right. Yep. And then that's another 12 points of slashing damage. Okay, go ahead and describe how you dispatch this Duragar. Sure. So I, at first, uh, I swing around and the pole axe basically cleaves his hand, like kind of his palm of his hand, like right in half. The atlatl, atlatl, God, geez, goes You're flying. Welcome. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> goes uh <laughs> flying off and as he kind of like looks at his hand for a moment like kind of like when the t-1000 gets frozen um that gig gave me just enough time to kind of spin the poleaxe in my hand come down for an overhead smash with a hammer and and just drive his head actually into his body Oof, yeah. um as uh uh he just kind of stops for a second just kind of goes rigid and just kind of falls Now it's the end of my turn. And you hear the faint flapping of owl's wings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that means it's Christoph's that, yep, turn. It is yep. Christoph's turn. Dude, see? Barker's way better at passing. The, he's, he's, doing the, he's doing the initiative pass off here. I love it. And so, um, so, the, you know, as I see Edric charge the bridge and basically is this, as broad as two of these duo cars standing shoulder to shoulder. Um, there's still one on the front line. And... Uh... <laughs> Got me in chat. Sorry, Sorry that was me. That was, that was me. great. That was great. No, listen. The um, enormous beating of owl's wings uh, and the shadow of a large bird uh, sort of cascades across the bridge and uh, what I what I'm going to do is rip into the minion uh, by any of the portions of the armor that might have a crag or a crack or some sort of a connecting piece and I'm going to get these huge talons in there and I'm going to just squeeze and pull upward lifting the creature up so that I can uh, tear its nose off with my beak. Okay, yep. That sounds awesome and violent. Perfect. And so that yeah. is a successful... So what I'm doing is multi-attack. So cool. the, the vulture is... I'm using a giant vulture stat block to be a white snow owl. And so um, that first attack, the talons, is going to do a total of... Nine... And the second attack with the beak will do eight damage. Okay, 17 total. Yep. Killer. Uh, yeah, you just you tear into this guy. And uh, as you get close, uh, and Edric, you would have noticed this too, that the um, the skin of the Duergar is almost translucent. Like it's this blue kind of icy white. And you can see the veins like running through their body almost. And you can kind of almost see they're kind of almost gaunt where you can see like the bones and like skeletal structure beneath their skin it's really unnerving and they have like these um their eyes are red that just like contrast so vividly with this like ice blue skin these like red eyes that peer out from under their helmets and uh these eyes just kind of widen in surprise as this gigantic owl just swoops in 
grabs this guy and just begins rending him with talons and beak. Uh, and he's still alive, but uh, definitely hurting from that attack. Yeah, and uh, that will be uh, the end of my turn. Um, and I'm just going to basically... Oh, wait. This is just something that I have to remember. So it also has pack ta- pack tactics, mm-hmm. which means that as long as I'm within five feet of an ally that isn't incapacitated, uh, I have advantage on attack rolls. Oh, um, okay, yeah. So I'm just telling you in case I forget, because that's exactly the kind of thing that cool. I'll forget. Yep, killer. So I'm going to will... swoop around Ed on purpose, like yep. narratively. St- staying, staying close to him, benefiting from that pack tactics. That's killer. Okay, uh, I believe Sander. it is Sander, yeah. You're muted, Nate. Yay! Sander Yay! speaks, it but no It hadn't happened yet. We're like four <laughs> hours in, and Nate hadn't accidentally muted his mic. It was really close to happening in the intro. Oh, where we were man, that would have been ourselves. killer. We would have been like, yeah. we're is back, baby. Uh, During Nate's turn, I'm going to be like... All right, so uh, do I have enough movement to get to Eddie? I believe I 35, you do. 35, 35 feet. Speed. Oh, yeah. Oh, as the crow flies, baby. Yeah, that's fine. Right. You get up there. I fly over the wall. Yeah. Um, okay. I imagine you you parkour over this shit. Yeah. You monk. Pole vault. All right. Mm-hmm. So um, I am going to attack this guy. And let's just see how that goes here. Let's see if I can remember how to play D&D with a All monk. Right. So quarter staff. Smack at a dude for a 10. No. Uh, does not hit. Looking for yeah. 16 or better. Okay. And then I'm going to, as a bonus action, do my flurry of blows. And that's a 10. Wait, does flurry of blows give you two attacks or no? It's just like an extra attack. I think so. I seem to remember you doing like 15 attacks on your turn for some reason. Somehow. It says here, oh, flurry of blows. It's... After you take the attack action, you can spend one key point to make two unarmed strikes. Yeah, okay. that's right. That's right. So I'll do one more. Because you... this don't one is a 23 always... to hit. Oh, yeah, that definitely hits. Don't you always get a free unarmed strike with your attack? Yeah, but flurry okay. of blows gives me two, and I can trigger special uh, things if it that's hits, right. I think. Yes. So. Yeah. I have to mark a key point if I can figure yeah, out how to do fun. that. I forgot how to play D&D, D&D too. Beyond. Where, where them key points at? Features and traits. There we go. Okay. Sorry. If it ain't in a dead man's forget. guide to dragon grin, I don't know how it works. <laughs> uh, I done replaced all the knowledge in my brain with other stuff. <laughs> now you're on a, I'm just now a simple on. southern. I'm yeah. just a simple southern game designer. Now, did I forget <laughs> the rules of 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons? Yes. Certainly. Definitely the minutiae. <laughs> okay, so he gets pushed fifteen feet. Oh, I don't do know if dis- I or or I'm wondering to if I can just direction? toss him off. I don't know yeah. if I can toss him off. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. My my kick goes like boom that way. It's a round house. Yes, it is a round house. I <laughs> so I imagine it like. Because you come up and you do like a couple of attacks, like you do a bunch of like stuff with your staff and then go for a punch. And this Duergar is just kind of like blocking and parrying and he kind of goes, <laughs> kind of gets this laugh. And then you just <laughs> and just like kick him off the side of the bridge. Uh, and he goes, ah, he does the Wilhelm screen and disappears into the mist. Uh, well done, Sander. <laughs> All right, uh, we're back up at the top of the initiative, um, but first, this wind comes up from the ravine. I need everyone to make a dexterity saving throw, please. Owls don't make that shade. <laughs> they eat them. What? <laughs> Five to minutiae. <laughs> that first number is my actual roll. The second one was the typo. You said 153. That's that. Uh, I'm pulling a real Jeff on. Doty here. So yeah, I Jeff Doty. Say, yeah. Did you say 800 damage? Um, <laughs> okay, so everyone. Where's yours, Tim? You failed? Uh, What'd you roll? So, well, I rolled a four 
And so unless, and I have a plus two, so it's a six. Do you want to so use cool. your inspiration point or do you want to suffer the effects of whatever? I want to suffer the effects. Okay, Let's go. Let's go too. old school provokers. Everyone Barney. confess your love for Tim in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone say how much you love Tim Carney. Because he's about to die. I'm just kidding. Listen, Masochist. kill me. You know uh, why? Of all the times to get hurt, it's now. Because I will just turn back into naked Kristoff if you right. kill this owl. So. Um, Want to see that. I thought I was muted. I Nate, I was just, muted. Nate just <laughs> said the quiet better. part loud. Nate just said the quiet part loud. Oh, my God. Oh, I, I just love that you still would have said it muted. You're like, I'm going to say this out loud, <laughs> even though no that. one can hear me. Sh show me that. We're all paying. Where's the virtual <laughs> tabletop for that? <laughs> so uh, this wind that kicks up, it's carrying ice and uh, uh, water up, and it kind of uh, crashes into this bridge. Everyone is buffeted by this wind, um, and everyone manages to keep their footing but Kristoff, you're airborne, and this wind just kicks up unexpectedly and fills your wings and kind of immediately pushes you down and crashes you into the stone of the bridge, um, dealing eight bludgeoning damage and pushing you 15 feet. So you've landed here on the bridge uh, okay. prone uh, from this wind. <laughs> and now we're at the top of the initiative, Holly. The winds of Talmor the, during the monsoon season begin, are, are battering against Holly's grip on her crossbow and her mother's next to her saying, steady, steady now. And the apple across the river feels like a pinprick in the distance. Same with the, um, what the, this main, this main baddie, Holly likes to shoot the leaders first. Mm-hmm. What is this main baddie doing? What do they look like? What are they engaging in right now? He is actually looking at Kristoff. And you see this, like, through this helmet, you see this this pale blue face and these red eyes leering at this owl that has just crashed into the stone. And this Duergar steps forward, and you see the armor it's wearing. It's white dragon scale, probably harvested from these drakes. And he steps forward and he unfurls this chain that has these icicle like barbs on it. And this doer guard like brings the chain up and you can see that he's about to bring it down on Chris Owl. Is that what is that what it is? Chris Owl? It was Owl. Chris Owl or Owl Stoff? Oh, it, was, it was Chris. I think it was, was just was it Owl, Owl Stoff. Stoff. Owl Toff. Owl Toff. Owl Toff. He's Owl about Owl to bring it down on Owl Toff. And then if you're a wolf, it's Chris Pine. Yes. <laughs> that's correct. God, that's so funny. Through the winds of Talmor, across the river, she fires at this Durgar. I'm freaking nailing it with this wooden die yeah. that dice carved that you all gifted me. That is a 23. That hits. Oh, man. Ooh, come on. I'm due for a one, though, so here we go. I should pre-roll like Tim. Oh, look, it's a one. Uh, <laughs> plus plus uh, four is five. Five damage. Five damage. Okay. It's a glancing blow but it at least catches his attention. And he kind of peers across the ravine and you see these eyes that almost seem to glow from within the helmet, glaring at you, Holly, sighting at you. Those red, are they red eyes? Oh, they're red. They're red like the two distant apples that uh, Holly is going to use her action surge, right? Uh -huh. That gives me a second action. It does. To fire through both of them at once. What's the, uh, it's a 10. Is that a miss? That is a miss. This guy's AC is 15. The winds of Talmor veer the crossbow bolt off target and it collides into the river or into the ravine. Yeah. Okay. Any movement on your turn, Holly, or are you staying put? Holly stays put. 
she closes her eyes, breathes in. Situation over there. Here's the guidance of her mother, and sees what the Durgar are about to do now. The Durgar with the chain reaches into his uh, armor and brings out what looks like a glass orb that has this sloshing blue liquid in it. It almost looks like this Mountain Dew voltage that I'm drinking. He speaks a word in this language and hurls it. I need Edric and Sander to please give me a strength saving throw. I got a 14. Okay. And that's a 22 for me. Okay. So, this glass orb strikes the bridge behind you. And as it smashes, this blue liquid just sort of coats the bridge and instantly turns into ice. And both of you manage to, uh, as the ice begins to encase your leg, you smash through the ice and keep yourself from becoming rooted to the spot. You do, however, take four cold damage from it, even though you succeeded. The leader then steps forward a couple of steps, brings this lash and prepares to strike Kristoff, who is prone, so he's going to have advantage on this attack. That is going to be a hit with uh, 17 plus 5, 22. Um, so, Kristoff, you're going to take uh, 6 slashing damage and 4 cold damage, and I need you to give me a uh, strength saving throw, please. <clears throat> 15 all up so okay right. <clears throat> this Duergar brings this lash down on you Kristoff and you feel the barbs of it strike you and deal this damage that is both uh, rending your flesh but also freezing you and you can feel the lash tightening around you but even in this this form you have this strength, and you manage to break free of this chain and keep yourself from becoming restrained uh, by this Duergar. Um, he kind of grits his teeth in frustration and prepares another strike. Um, this Duergar comes charging forward. As it does so, it's dropping its atlatl and pulling out this strange blade, this curved, wicked blade that looks like it may have been formed of ice somehow. It's like eking this cold frost uh and it's going to swing at sander who to him appears the most vulnerable but he's uh, likely in for a rude awakening here Ooh, that is actually going to hit though 17 on the die and they get a plus four so that'll be 22 total and sander you're going to take six piercing damage plus three cold damage as this strange frozen blade cuts into you. And finally, this guy here, let's see, range. He's going to move, come forward a bit, coming up alongside his commander, and he's going to wheel back with this atlatl and hurl it at Edric. But, the icicle smashes uselessly against your armor, or your shield comes up and blocks it, Edric. All right. Uh, I believe, Edric, you are up. Yes, you've witnessed your companion, Sander, injured and dodged an atlatl. This is what I'm supposed to do, right, as the initiative buddy? You're doing Nailed a great it. job, Barker. Nailed it. We need those transitions. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'll go up, and I'll make an attack against the Durgar in front of us. 
That is a 23 to hit. Yeah. Yep. And um, I am going to use another uh, another uh, action surge, or not action surge, excuse me, uh, another uh, superiority dice this time uh, with a trip attack. Uh, so it'll be uh, 10 points of slashing damage. And uh, we also need to make a strength save. What's the DC? 14. They fail. Okay. And so the uh, it is now that Duragar is considered not prone. I'm going to put a little color on it to help me remember that. Now, I don't imagine it's proner, but it's pretty prone. It's pretty prone. Yeah. It's pretty prone, you guys. All right. Pretty prone. Um, I believe. It's Kristoff's turn. Yeah, Christoph, it's the pretty... owl. You... Ow. Chain boy is in front of you. That chain I'm boy. running out of narrative chain transitions. Chain boy is in front of you. <laughs> Dummy thick chain boy Dummy is in front of chain you. Dummy thick chain boy. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage. <laughs> Just let me think, Chain Boy. It's just like one of those chain demons from like third yeah. edition. I joined yeah. that Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> now that's the OnlyFans. My that's friend. an OnlyFans. Yeah. So Kristoff the Owl looks at the camera and with his beak says, "Spaghetti and Mountain Dew are canon in Aramoth." <laughs> uh, that's my late. turn. I used a whole action for that. No. Uh, you did. You're so. also out of the campaign, coincidentally. Co- coincident, unrelated. <laughs> unrelated. Unrelated, but uh, you're out. Just yeah. boot me from the Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like, ba-doo. You're like, Guys? The cameras are all crooked, and you don't even yeah, care. You're I don't even like, care. Um, so I think <laughs> Nate's face is up in the battle map somehow. <laughs> Owlbear Rodeo starts working. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I think what would happen, especially is like, as the, in, in this last turn, as I have been struck so, so hard, I think you would see this splash of crimson against the white owl, uh, as I am wounded pretty badly, especially from all this damage. Um, and so, uh, with my, like my retaliatory attack. I'm kind of beating my wings back and I'm trying to escape this, uh, this lash and I, I break free of it. And then I try to rend with my talons and, and strike with my beak. Uh, I am successful with the beak and I do seven damage. So I'm able to just peck or claw, but I am actually, I critically failed with my talons and that was with advantage. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So I rolled two ones wow. on my, my two d twenty. So I was like, "Well, this is meant to be." Okay. Uh, so um, however you want to handle that, I don't know. I'm I'm gonna say that uh, this guy basically gets advantage on his attack against you on his turn on his next turn. Okay. Perfect. Uh, and I'm gonna put a color kill him. <laughs> heart um, them, heart them. That's what he says. <laughs> So what I'll do as well is I will, um, because it, I would I would have to stay engaged with him or I would give him a free attack of opportunity. Is that correct? Basically, like if I try to fly away, like yes, I'll... unless you yeah. have that. What's that flyby thing where you don't get attack nah, opportunity? Yeah. I I don't have that. Ah, <laughs> damn vulture. Ah oh, vulture. But that would be where I would end my turn. Is just locked in combat, beating my wings and sort of trying to protect myself. Cool. Okay. Kill him, you hear Sander over the wind after being rendered. Okay. Uh, I'm going to attack this guy that is uh, somewhat prone in front of me with plain old attack with my quarter staff. I smack down, and that's a natural one. You do have apart. advantage against this guy because he is prone. Oh, okay. Okay. So that is rather than a 16 to hit. Yeah, that hits. Okay. And that will be for 
six damage, and then I will do an unarmed strike as well. A heal comes down upon him. No, it does. Oh, that's with advantage too, or no? Yeah, it's with advantage. Oh, yeah, wow. okay. he's no less prone than he was before. I'm rolling all Proner, kinds of d20s he here. Even more prone. Even prone. More prone. All right. Um, and that's going to be a 19 to hit. So then there is five damage. So six and then five. Correct. 11 total. Okay. He's not looking good, but he's still, still kicking. Okay. And then I would like to um, move mm -hmm. back behind Edric about 10 feet if I can. I yeah. think because he's prone, I don't provoke an opportunity attack, do I? Correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. I'm good. All right. Awesome. Uh, next up, Barker. Uh, Barker, you're up. Thanks, bro. Barker, you, Barker, you're up. Thanks, Holly, bro. Thanks, bro. Holly can't get a good shot at the chain-wielding Durgar. So she's back on, uh, mounted on her river bear. Her mom behind her. She's going to move downward about 15 feet, maybe 20 feet um, from where she is. You can see like south. I guess she moves south. Um and the scenery changes in the background. She finally comes through. And I assume that if I move 20 feet to the south, Matt, I'll have a clearer shot at that chain-wielding Durgar. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, you will. This is the hardest test yet. Apple on a branch. River bear drive-by. But she's confident at this point. <laughs> In her that's young my, that's training. my favorite Rage Against the Machine song. <laughs> River Bear Drive River Bear Drive by, yeah. <laughs> River Bear, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fourteen. Fourteen does not hit. Overconfidence was her weakness. The crossbow bolt sticks into the tree that the branch with the apple is hanging from. Shit, she says, and her mom smacks her on the back of the head. <laughs> oh my god, I love it. That's uh, so good. All right, who's next? You could try and stop the bear, <laughs> but you can't stop the river. <laughs> Some of those that wheel chains are the same that ride ice brains. brains. Yeah. Oh, ice, brain. ice yes. for brains. There you go. Okay. It's ice for brains. But it's those ice for brains. It's their turn now. Okay, <clears throat> this guy is standing up from being prone and is going to strike out at Edric with this wicked-looking frost blade. But the AC is just too thick, and he can't get through it. The uh, This Durgar here kind of sneers as uh, he sees Holly get closer and he's going to move down the bridge to get into range. And he wheels back with this atlatl and hurls it. But the you hear it. <laughs> the icicle kind of go past, uh, just barely missing you, Holly. The warden, that's what he is, the warden, is he's caught Kristoff in a disadvantageous position. It's bad news. He, he wheels back. You hear the lash extend out to its full length. And he brings it down. Please That's be a, a 20. That's a crit. Uh, oh, so, Sorry. Please, Barker goes, please be a 20. I know. I just, I want to see what no, it I does. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm so um, sorry. Everyone's actually hitting on the line. So, Tim... Yes. 12 slashing damage. Dag gum. Plus 8 cold damage. Yikes, boys. And I need you to make a strength saving throw. Okay, let's do that so that I can add all of this death at once. Okay, so that's 11 on the saving throw. Okay. The lash, this chain with these icicle barbs wraps around you, dealing this damage and it gets pulled taut, and this Duergar pulls you towards him, pulling you within five feet, and he reaches back, and he's got this dagger 
of the Ugh. same uh, material that these other blades are made out of, this, like, ice crystal. And he comes back with this dagger, and he's going to stab it downward. Dang, dude, I just got Owlbear Rodeoed. <laughs> okay. Owlbear Rodeoed. Like oh, man. Spaghetti. Like a dinosaur spaghetti. Oh, he does have advantage on this because you are restrained. Zurium um, spaghetti. Is your AC any different in your in It is. Form? In fact, it's abysmal. So, for, oh, so cool. it, yeah, so it's a 10. Um, so you you essentially hit like without Automat rolling. It's auto yeah. hit. <laughs> so, um, so that's going to be seven more piercing damage. So it was eight, 12, seven. Is that right? Yep. Eight, 12, seven, okay. and then three for some additional ice damage. Eight, 12, so seven, three. 30 so, damage total. Okay. So I have some good news and then I have some bad news if you want. <laughs> I'll just actually, there's no good news. I just have some bad news. So <laughs> the first thing that happens is I lose the last four hit points of the owl, but all of that damage splashes over. So mm -hmm. of that, so we'll do the eight because that'll be the easiest for me to count in my head. So, and then five, six, seven, eight, then 12, you say. Mm hmm. And you said four and then three. No, seven and then three. Seven and then three. Okay. Okay. Kristoff uh, is down. Okay. I, I'm I'm for sure down. You you wrecked the owl, and then you worked through all my hit points in one hit. <laughs> so what you see. Uh, all of you is this lash go around this owl and this warden, this Duergar warden lifts up the owl on the end of the lash, stabs into it with this knife and you see Kristoff revert to his human form and immediately collapse onto the bridge and the Duergar just kind of like lets him fall and he holds out both weapons, the lash and the knife and sort of like looks to Holly specifically, sort of like, what are you gonna do now? And just like stares her down with these weapons out. Fortunately, okay. Holly has great friends and it might not be about what she's gonna do now, but what Sander does. And it is your turn, Sander. Ping. Too much pressure. Too much <laughs> pressure. All right. Um, Sander is going to. Um, boy. Sander's going to move up to the uh, closest uh, Dorgar and attack with the, the quarter staff. Um, and that is going to be a 13 to hit. Does not hit. No. Okay. And then Sander is going to uh, use a bonus action to dodge. Okay. All right. Uh, who's up next? <sighs> Holly doesn't see Kristoff fall. Holly sees her first mission back in Talmor, the rain falling, and she's gazing through the crossbow sights at a bullywug, one of the many that terrorize the surrounding landscapes of Talmor. She, this time, hears her mother's voice in her head and she's not with her. Aim low. You know your natural point is high. 13. Does not hit. Brrr far too low. She realizes she should have trusted her instincts. And for a moment she flashes and she's here in the present. She's no longer in this fantasy land that she's made up to make this fight easier on herself. And she sees Kristoff's collapsed form on the bridge and she runs onto the bridge to help Kristoff and Sander vaulting over this raised yep. portion onto the bridge. She vaults over that. She lowers her crossbow onto the sling and she pulls out both of her hand axes. Dope. She sees red. 
But what are the baddies going to do? Remember remember when she secretly kept the troll cutter? No. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to place this shard of uh, spear right in this dude's neck and be like, you're going to die in like 10 years, I swear. <laughs> and you're going to think of me. You're going to think of me you're when gonna, it happens. You're uh, going to die of heart disease. What is your AC right now, Edric? Uh, my AC is 19. Okay, that's going to be a hit then. Finally. Excellent. And the best part is, is I get to use uh, one more superiority dice. I'm going to make, uh, I get to make a uh, repost. Right, post? Rip, you know what? You know what I mean. Oh, reposti. Reposte. Reposte. Here. Spaghetti. And I'm here. Here. I was Repos waiting. Spaghetti. You get to make it the Mizzurium of spaghetti. <laughs> Popo reposte. Ripeta posti. Exactly. Boobity bobbity. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah. So, I'm going to use my superiority die to, to use a reaction to hit a creature that just hit me. Um, and that is a. 21 to hit. Yep. Coo, coo, coo. Well, four, 16 damage. Obviously, <laughs> I still take the damage from from the Durgar, but... Uh... Yeah, so you're going to take uh, from his Rhyme Blade, uh, you're going to take... Uh, bah, 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 bah. You're going to take six piercing damage plus three cold damage. What does it look like, though, as this Durgar stabs you and then you kill him, Edric? Uh, I, I mean, I'm just in, I'm just in like a foul mood. I am way too cold, uh, and I've been hurt, and I'm hurt a lot. So um, as he stabs me, I actually like grab his arm and do it, you know do it uh, uh, orc style where I just kind of like walk up the blade a little bit, but just close enough. Like I've got the, the pole, like the pole ax in my hand and I just stab him through the eyeball. Uh, Cause that let red dots a perfect, perfect target. So just pole ax and then kind of push him right over. So he just kind of like pins right to the bridge. Yep. He topples over. He's down this Duergar here. Seeing that happen charges forward and is going to try and attack you, Edric. Misses, though. You easily recover and parry at the same time. The Warden does not get that recharge. Comes forward and is going to lash out with this chain weapon at Sander, but misses Sander. The, the chain sort of sort of hits the bridge uh, as you sort of dodge out of the way and it sends chunks of stone flying as it as it hits the bridge uh, and every time he does it he like wheels it back and spools it and then does it again uh, alright that's Durgar. who's up next that would be Edric himself perfect Local boy, Edric. The, ah, we have a local kid. Uh, I am going to... Uh, I guess I can't really move past that guy without hitting a, a attack of opportunity. Yeah, I'm just going to... Uh, just going to attack, uh, attack schnapps there in front of me. And that's in 16 to hit. That'll do it. That's what you're looking for. Boy, uh, and that's seven points of slashing damage. Okay. You clip him pretty good, but he's still standing. Anything else in your turn, Edric? Uh, actually, Yar. Like to use the um, second wind. Oh, yeah, second wind. Uh, so I could regain uh, some, some, some HP back. <laughs> Boy, you're going to need it. Uh, so, yeah. Even with my... And I didn't realize this, that I keep forgetting I'm a very inhuman because this was made in the oily days where I also have DR3. Oh, right. Yep. 
Yeah. So anyway, I gained five hit points. I will take those and I will treasure them until I get hit. <laughs> All right. Uh, who's Christoph. up? Christoph. I think Christoph needs to make death yeah, saving death throw. Death saving throw. Yep. Yeah. So you see uh, it is that sort of slow motion quiet where you just hear the echo. You know, you see this a few really uh, impactful times in Lord of the Rings uh, where it's just like, and the wind is all Kristoff can hear blowing over the bridge, blowing over him. And his body feels a different kind of cold. This lash that has gripped him in this dagger that has plunged um, deep into his flesh has made him frozen to his core. And as he watches his dark, almost black blood flow out onto this bridge, he swears that he hears his brother's voice just faintly. Uh, and Kristoff has failed his first death save. Okay. Should that be, hold on. Do, I'm sorry. It's been so long since 5e and I, I shouldn't have brought that. I, if I could take back bringing this up, I would because it might be negative. But do you roll a death save immediately when you fall down? You do not. Um, it's not okay. until the next turn. Not yet. So not until the next turn. Yeah. Awesome. No, no, but it really question, was. Though. That's a really good question. But that is exactly what I'd done. I, I, it was time. I had to pay the piper. Pay the piper. Sander. All right. Sander uh, is going to move up to the uh, warden or captain or whatever it is. And I uh, am going to... Yeah, I'm just going to uh, try to hit him with my quarterstaff. Um, so I, I kind of leap over one of these chain strikes and um, kind of almost tiptoe over the chain. And as he kind of pulls it up, I leap and strike him with Neat. the quarterstaff. Very cool. That's a natural 20. Oh, shit. All right, baby. Nice. It feels so good. Okay, here we go. Um, so that is going to be, it's not that magnificent, I guess. It's 10 damage. 10 damage, damage. With yep. double? Yeah. Okay. And um, and then I'm going to spend another key point to dodge as a bonus action. Great. Okay. Who's up next? Oh, I think it's you, Holly. Is Holly's running, sprinting towards Kristoff, and she's on the bridge. She's above an endless abyss underneath. The wind is roaring around her. Talmor is far away, hundreds of miles, maybe thousands. She is going to collide in with the collide with the person that's fighting with Sander, the warden. I believe there's an attack of opportunity that that Durgar that she ran by might have. There's enough space where you can skirt past him without without uh, getting an okay. attack of opportunity. Sander's also a little wee. So Holly jumps over Sander maybe a little bit. Um, and with these two hatchets, these tomahawks, one in each hand, she's going to bring them down on the warden. Oh, okay. 18. On the first one, I can swing with the second one, but I don't add my bonus, right? Correct. Yep. And that'll be your bonus action doing that. Okay, yes. And that's a 12 on the second one, which I don't think hits. It'll be a miss, yeah. <clears throat> that is... Our hand axes finesse... They are not. Okay, so four damage. Four damage, okay, got it. Thanks for the honesty and the reminders. Yeah. Okay. Mm. They're baddies. The Duergar in front of Edric is going to try and do his best to punch through that armor, but just can't hack it. The Warden mm -hmm. 
feeling a little overwhelmed now that he's surrounded. He's going to make two attacks with this blade of his. One coming at Holly, which will hit. And that'll be four slashing damage and two cold damage, Holly. And a second attack coming at uh, Sander. But because of that dodge, you're good. You can't bust through that dodge, baby. All right. That's all the baddies left. And so next would be Edric. All right. Uh, once again, I'm going to attack the schmuck right in front of us. Me. Well, us. Uh, that's a 17 to hit. That hits. That'll be 11 points of slashing damage. Oof. Okay, he's not looking good. Still standing. Uh, and that'll be that'll be it for me. Okay. I believe it's uh, Christoph. Christoph. Throw time, yeah. You're muted. You're muted as hell, boy. Sorry, I was saying this time I waited. <clears throat> okay. I'm not going to tell you whether I succeeded or failed. Oh, this guy. This guy. All right. Sander, thank you. Yeah, maybe. No. Yeah, sure. We'll go with that. All right. I am going to uh, attack this guy with my quarter staff. Hey. Man, um, am I? Yeah, yeah, I am. Okay. All right, cool. That's a 22 to hit. That hits. And that is going to be 11 damage on my non-crit. <laughs> Damn, okay. And, um, and then I am going to use my last key point to dodge. So I'm gonna stop you for a sec you actually just took this guy out oh okay so if you want to take back that dodge you can yeah go ahead, and tell, go ahead and tell me how you take this guy out this warden okay so yeah i imagine um i actually um hmm if, if it's all right with you i'm actually going to kind of wrap my uh foot around the the chain which i'm imagining he dropped on the ground I'm going to wrap it around my foot and I'm going to wrap it around his foot. <laughs> and then I am going to, uh, so I'm just kind of whipping my foot around here as the chain is just kind of, and, um, and then I would like to uh, actually um, yank him down off the bridge. Um, and quickly, I imagine I'm, I'm going to make a uh, dexterity saving throw to see um how it goes trying to get it off my foot or dexterity i guess just dexterity check if that's cool with you matt that's fine with me all right pulling pull a tim carney special <laughs> where is that that dangled next there it is okay yeah i rolled an 18 so i'm i'm gonna say i managed to yeah. get it off okay <clears throat> uh there's a, maybe a moment of fear as i'm like oh crap and then uh, it comes off my foot and he plummets down. Yeah, he kind of like, he falls. His helmet comes toppling off, clattering across the bridge, coming to rest near Kristoff's body. And then he kind of grabs the ledge for a second. And then he just falls and you see his form just disappear into the mist, uh, gone forever. And I'm sorry we just missed out on any loot, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but I use Mage Hand real quick to grab his sword. <laughs> Let's do D and D's. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Holly sprints forward towards. Oh, sorry. No, you go. Stand or anything else on your turn? <laughs> I do have movement, so yeah, I would sprint over to Kristoff. Okay, <laughs> sorry. You Thank come. You, that, you do the the home run slide over to Kristoff, uh, and he's he's not looking good. Okay. 
Holly does the same. She gets to Kristoff, falls to her knees, and buries both hatchets in the stone bridge. She doesn't know much about medicine. Just the basics she learned in Talmor. Just treating skinned knees. But there was one time there was a bad wound, and she shoves cloth into the, the bleeding, I assume it's bleeding, the, the open wound on Kristoff. And she's going to roll medicine mm -hmm. to try to stabilize him. Thirteen. Yep, that does it. So, like Durgan saved dice, Holly <laughs> saves Kristoff. Mm -hmm. I had failed the second death throw. Oh man! And that's Whoa. why I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want it to be like, okay, stop combat and let's go. I was like, nope. I was like, if I die on this bridge, I'm gonna die on this bridge. I was like, I'm not. I'm not gonna say it. Kristoff um, is stable but still unconscious. And since Holly's not going to do anything else. She's just going to keep holding the cloth there. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and since I took a crit and dropped to zero, um, we are going to do a lingering injury, right? Yes. You don't get lingering injuries from crits, but because you dropped to zero, yes. Dropped to zero. Okay. So, so uh, I asked Matt in the chat if we could use the maimed table in a dead man's guide to dragon grin there's a whole section on brutal combat and so <laughs> this table is very severe so i almost had second thoughts about it but i'm like no you know what let's let's ride this out so i'm gonna do this live and i'm very nervous because if you look at like the first 20 entries it's really bad <laughs> yeah like blinded deafened like things that are just not great okay oh boy whoa this is intense Okay, for anyone who has a Dead Man's Guide to Dragon Grin, you are going to know what I rolled first. No one in this game look, but I rolled a 44. Anyone who's helped write this book yeah. is holding their breath right now. <laughs> okay. So, as the so we're, we're are we technically out of initiative? Is that correct? No, there's still one guy. Oh, okay. Then I'm not going to tell you what the wound is. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Okay, who's up next, Barker? It would be bad guys, right? Uh, Christoph is. No, it's bad guys, right? No, it's Christoph, and then after Christoph is Christoph again. <laughs> no, and then wait, after Christoph, until Sander? we figure out what the lingering injury right, is. Right, right, it's right, right, always right. And then it was Holly. San it's Sander's turn. Oh, yeah. And then. No, 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 no. no. You just it was Sander, Holly. then it was Holly. Oh, sorry. I and thought now, for some reason, Holly? I thought Chris went because of the lingering no, injury. So it's bad guys, right? Bad guys, yep. It's oh, bad I get guys. one more chance. Okay. All right, I rolled a 17 on the die. Your AC is 19, correct, Edric? So I hit because I get plus four. Okay, so four slashing damage, two cold damage. Just want to say that we're all really proud of you right now. <laughs> I did. I hit Edric. I actually hit you like three or four times. I don't know why I'm... You did, yeah. But actually, I... the the uh, the first hit, that's the one that was really painful. Yeah. Um. So sorry, it was four slashing. Four so... slashing and two cold. So one, two, three. So... One hot sandwich. Okay. Two cold sandwiches. <laughs> well, I had to work the DR three thing. One in there, I'm not. Jazz. I'm not used to. I'm not used to DR like damage reduction. Oh That's... yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm one of those newbie type of D and D players. <laughs> All right, that was baddies. There's only one guy left, so I think now... It's Edric's turn. It is Edric's turn. Yep, and I'm going to do the thing. The thing... Oh, shoot. <laughs> I don't know why, but I thought everyone, someone else was going to get that guy. <laughs> so I started putting my dice away. <laughs> this guy's putting his put, loading up his bag before the bell <laughs> rings, and the teacher's like, the bell hasn't rung! Edric. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone ran past him fighting to mm -hmm. save Kristoff, and he's just like, "Oh, guys." <laughs> so uh, that was a that was an eighteen. That'll hit. All right. And that is eight and four, so that's twelve points of piercing damage. 
What does it look like as you topple this guy and finish this combat? I just feel like it's been like just two people, just like two big people just slugging it out, you know, like stabbing and then attacking. And then finally I'm like, okay, this is really starting to get on my nerves. And then just, I'll, I'll just like come up with a really quick like stab and then like kind of up through the jaw and then kind of like lead him, lead his kind of he- head around until he's kind of like hanging over the bridge and then just kind of quickly pull out the spike, just letting him kind of fall off. And then I'm going to go run to check on Mr. Kristoff. All right, Kristoff. What are we looking at here, buddy? So um, <clears throat> there's a lot of blood, so it's difficult to tell. Not just Kristoff's, but there's, you know, there's been a lot of bloodshed on this bridge. And so especially where the dagger went into Kristoff. Um, you could see that there's a lot of blood, uh, but as often as happens in combat, there are these incidental wounds, these things that happen as knives push down past the strain of, you know, someone holding it back or as a sword hits, uh, you know, and then slices through various pieces and so as, you know, Kristoff kind of, um, he sort of, you know, he comes to and there's just blood all over him, especially on his face. And um, he looks to you, Holly, and you see, and he, he reflexively, there's actually a, a pretty bad wound on his face. And he goes to uh, to wipe that wound, and you see that actually, uh, as he wipes the wound, there is actually a gaping hole where his nose once was. And as he looks at you with this now skeletal visage, with his nose just totally gone, I can't, I can't help but imagine that Holly's like look is shock. And he would just, noseless, would say, what? Holly, Holly says, are you okay, buddy? yeah and then he kind of like he kind of like slouches over um just totally exhausted and holly would start gathering cloth from edric and sander and slowly turn the process of tending to Kristoff to probably i think sander would be the the most adept at this Kristoff would be the most adept at this. She says, healing word your face to Kristoff. Uh, no, she, she rises as people begin helping Kristoff and looks to the big door. All of this for some big door. You're all standing on this bridge. And the bridge itself is covered in blood. Duerger lie dead. And a wind rushes up from the ravine. It's snowing. And as the snow falls on the bridge, it immediately becomes sodden with this blood that has been spilled. The camera pans up from everyone huddled around Kristoff. And we see this door, heavy, made of stone. And depicted on the door, we see a figure standing, armored. And he's holding aloft the sphere. 
What awaits behind that door? We'll have to wait until next time. Oh, that was a long session, but I would be lying if I said it wasn't the most fun I've ever had playing D&D. &D. <laughs> that felt real fast, and the chat was the best it's ever been, in my yes, opinion. Yes, chat was crazy good. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and for making us laugh so much. It was so fun to be able to keep an eye on the chat while the game was running, um, and it felt so good to run this game. So I don't want to keep these guys any later than I've already kept them. Uh, it's like five in the morning or something on the East Coast. I don't really know how to do math, but uh, I'm going to let these guys do some quick outros and then we're going to we're gonna uh, wait another year for another session. I'm just kidding. We're going to play next month. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and start uh, from my left to right. Barker. Hey everyone. My name is Barker uh, from Ignite Inspire the Story. And... I think you should at least head over to the Inspire the Story um, Patreon and just check it out to see if it's something you'd be interested in. I feel like a lot of people have that creative fire inside of them, but they don't really know how to focus it. And focusing it is something that I can speak for all of us in Abtab and definitely myself uh, has been a, a trial, a trial process over the last few years. And I want to help figure out what we can create together. And so give it a shot if you're interested at all and thanks for watching awesome uh mike go ahead uh this was quite the quite the experience um it's wonderful sitting back amongst friends again um, being able to play the provokers it's been a long too long um <clears throat> and yet it is kind of late and i do have to get up in like i don't know like five hours or so and go to work that's okay because it was all worth it. Um, thanks everyone watching. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Barker and Nate and Tim. Uh, incredible team of players to be with. Uh, it's, it's quite the experience. Awesome, man. Nate? Yeah, my name is Nate and you can find me on WASD20 and this was epic and uh, dramatic, uh, scary. <laughs> so thank you all. And Tim. Uh, hey, I'm Tim. I am uh, part of Tabletop Terrors. I'm also part of Absolute Tabletop. Um, the place I'll send you is the Absolute Tabletop Facebook group. If you want to hang out with the people that you saw in this chat, as well as us, it's a really cool place to go and be welcome and be accepted immediately. And so, um, you know, I, it was one of those things where this session, you know, a crit can change the game. And I just loved that it was not some big epic battle. It was some deadly Duergar on a bridge and a few choice hits. And I just was like, you know what? If I'm going to die, that would feel weird, but it would feel like, you know, right. Because Aronoth is deadly and we're in the frontiers of Aronoth, you know, so... I am very, very happy that it went this way. And I got to say, it was kind of weird to lose my nose <laughs> in the session. I wasn't expecting that, but it's going to be, I'm going to use it as, a, as an opportunity to shape the path that Christoph takes. And I think that'll be the fun part. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, uh, there are links down in the description so you can go follow all of these guys on YouTube. Um, definitely do that. And also check out the link below to the Absolute Tabletop official group, like Tim mentioned. Um, this was an absolute blast, an absolute pleasure. Uh, this is home for me, and it feels really good to be here. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in, for hanging out with us. And uh, as always, take care. Happy gaming, all. And may your pizzas always be hot and ready.